Yeah, bro. Come on, man. Well, excuse me. What a jerk. I should wrap him in my coils. Back off. Back off. Yo, Back yo, off. I got a vanilla snow cone. It's my favorite. Hey, bro, is the seat taken? Come on. I'm, uh, set tires. I pop one, have a hole in the bottom of it. <laughs> Yeah, if any of you gentlemen are interested, I've got some Clavatier and imported bovine Viagra for the after party. Hey, I'm sorry I'm so tall. I'll scooch down so that you can see over my giant head. I can't believe they invited me back for the 100th episode. Hi, I got a beer in each hand and three in my pisser. Where's the head? Speaking of the head. I wonder if that little bird over there in the Superman costume might join me for a little R&R &R in the companion restroom later. Herbie, you park here, and then I'll sit inside you. I heard there was a snake in this movie, MK, okay? just the way I like them. Everyone shut up, it's starting. Piss on the Yankees, piss on the Indians. McConaughey, I can see your phallus semi-erectus through those translucent terry cloth pants you're wearing. And I love the bongos. Oh, this should be good. And welcome to the Pick 6 Movies Podcast 100th episode Celebration Spectacular. I am Chad Cooper, and I'm so excited to be here on such a monumental occasion with my co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, as well as a live studio audience filled with celebrity guests. And every member of the Pick 6 Movies podcast staff and crew has joined us as well. Over the past three years, the staff of Pick 6 Movies have poured their blood, their sweat, and their tears into 99 spectacular episodes across 17 incredible seasons. What started out as a far-fetched idea to create a podcast where two middle-aged guys talked about movies has grown into the worldwide phenomenon that it is today. Who would have thought that a podcast where each season two hosts would pick six movies all related to a single theme and then provide insights on how and why each of the movies was made, followed by a full review of each film, would morph into the cultural landmark that is the Pick Six Movies podcast. I see over there in the studio audience, it's it's Daryl from Return of Swamp Thing. Good to see you, buddy. There's Big Dick Richie and that guy from Fifty Shades of Grey that whipped that girl's ass a whole lot. There's Pick Six Bot and the bees from The Swarm. Wait a minute, and the bees from Wicker Man are here. That's awesome. We got all of our interns here. There's you and what's your name and you over there, you know? What's that? Zoe De Chanel's here where? Of course she's in the bathroom. Look, everybody just make yourself comfortable. Servers will be around in a few minutes with champagne and cocktails. They'll have trays of amuse-bouche and small pedophores for those of you with a sweet tooth. Bo's slipping into his tuxedo because his eyebrow threading appointment ran a little long. Such a diva. But he wants to look nice for such an important occasion. And ugh, I'm so nervous. I mean, come on, look, uh, it's a regular episode, but it's not. It's the 100th episode featuring Zack Snyder's Justice League. All right, Chad, just breathe, take it easy, do the introduction, just like you've done 49 times before. Here we go. Filmmaking is a collaborative effort with many cooks in the cinematic kitchen all working to serve up the best possible motion picture meal that they can. Writers, producers, actors, editors, costumers, cinematographers, and countless others that you don't take time to acknowledge after the final fade to black and you're walking out of the theater. But there's one name on a film's credits that is universally acknowledged as the head chef, to carry the analogy forward, who brings together all of the disparate ingredients and skills of filmmaking to produce produce a singular focus to narrative, dialogue, character, visual style, and auditory influence to the silver screen. I'm talking about the director. If the movie is a success, it's the director who, rightfully or wrongfully, gets so much of the praise. But if the movie is a disaster, it's usually the director who, rightfully or wrongfully, gets 100% of the blame. The truth is that when a movie finally makes its way to theaters or streaming services, that film has gone through the Hollywood grinder, and multiple people have their fingerprints on the final film print. 
And throughout the filmmaking process, directors very often have to make concessions to appease producers and studio heads and rating boards to achieve final distribution of their movie. These changes can be small, insignificant edits, or they can completely disrupt the tone, narrative, and focus of the director's original vision. Hollywood is full of stories about filmmakers being banned from the editing suite by studio execs as battles over creative vision turns nasty and sometimes personal. These legendary tales often paint film executives as the bad guys, crushing a filmmaker's artistic vision for the sake of making money or hitting an immovable release date. But there are instances where a filmmaker's vision and their approach to movie making is just a little too weird or self-serving for the people fronting up the cash to get this movie made. And these people are looking for a positive financial return on their investment. When a director goes rogue, an intervention is not only appropriate, it's sometimes required. For most film directors making a movie for a large studio, the idea of having a final cut option included in a contract, it's not going to happen. Unless you are a very successful filmmaker with a track record of successful box office returns. And the studio knows that you making a bad movie is unlikely. And if it does happen, the fallout will hurt you, the director, almost as much as it would hurt the studio. In short, final cut options are usually done when it's a safe bet or part of a power play. To that point, if you're directing a movie and you don't have a final cut option in your contract, then you should be prepared to have others provide guidance, feedback, and suggestions on how your movie should be made, whether you want it or not. And this means that the movie that is ultimately released is not wholly your own. And although the success and failure of the film will be linked to a movie director's name, this outcome, good or bad, will mostly ignore the countless people who contributed to the final product. For some directors, the movie shown to audiences is so wildly different from their original vision that they will publicly come out and say that others were responsible for what is seen on the silver screen. This is not the movie I wanted to make. It's the movie I was forced to release. There is a version of my movie, and it is not the movie before your eyes in theaters. If only you, the movie-going audience, could see the genius behind the movie I originally envisioned in my mind. My edit of the movie, my cut of the film. In other words, the director's cut. When movies get made, there are a few different cuts of the film. There are rough cuts that stitch together pieces of the film, sometimes with and without special effects or all of the final music. There are the editor's cuts, which put the finishing touches on the movie and really help to tie the story together in the most focused and effective way possible. And that's what you see most of the time when you go to the movie theater. Then there are director's cuts. This is the version of the movie that most closely aligns with the movie the director conceived before everybody else came in and told the director how they should make their movie. One of the earliest examples of a filmmaker releasing a director's cut of their film was Charlie Chaplin's work on the movie The Gold Rush. That movie was originally released in 1925, but 17 years later, Chaplin released a director's cut of the film with a different musical score. It had voiceover narration. Some of the scenes from the original had been deleted, and he also had adjusted the movie's frame rate, which made the movie 23 minutes shorter than the original. Now, you may be wondering, why would a movie studio release one version of the movie in theaters and then turn around and release a second version of that same movie as a director's cut? Well, the answer is, they don't do that unless they can make more money by doing so, which isn't very often. And unless you're Charlie Chaplin, the vision of the movie that the director had in their head, more often than not, just stays in their head. And even if a director does have Final Cut privileges, the re-release of movies may not include such provisions. Case in point, in 1977, film director Steven Spielberg Maybe you heard of him? He released the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and Spielberg wasn't 100% happy with the movie when it was released. He wanted more time to make a better movie, but the studio wanted to get the film into theaters to start raking in mountains of cash. The film hit the theaters, and it was a huge success, and the aforementioned mountains of cash were raked in. And because the movie was so successful, Spielberg was given the opportunity to go back in, spend a little more time, and complete the movie that he originally wanted to release. Sort of. Three years after the original release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, an updated special release was brought back to theaters, but the studio tacked on a new ending that Spielberg did not like. In the film's first release, the finale involved the aliens returning the citizens that had been originally abducted back to Earth. Richard Dreyfuss's character joins the aliens on the spaceship, and he is never to be seen again. In the special release version, which was Spielberg's director's cut, there were seven minutes of additional 
additional footage that were added, but then there were 10 minutes of footage that were removed, which made the movie three minutes shorter than its original release. And most importantly, at the request of the studio, audiences got to see inside the spaceship, which was part of how the movie was marketed to get people to come back and pay a second time to see a movie that was shorter than the first time they saw it. Spielberg later said that he felt seeing inside the spaceship really destroyed the mystery of the aliens and undermined the film. 18 years later, the movie was re-re-re-released as a collector's edition, and it's kind of a mashup of the original theatrical release and the special edition release, but without those internal spaceship shots. And Spielberg considers this to be the definitive director's cut of Close Encounters. But you may be wondering, how did director's cuts become a thing as we know them today? I'm glad I asked. Well, some film historians credit a local Southern California pay television station, Z Channel, with the rise of director's cuts as we know them today. Z Channel hit the airwaves in the mid 70s and was offered up by Theta Cable. Z Channel's program director, Jerry Harvey, was given free reign to air whatever he wanted. Earlier in his career, Harvey, who was a passionate lover of movies, orchestrated a viewing of Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch to a sellout crowd at the Beverly Cannon Theater in Beverly Hills, California. But it wasn't just any screening. This was Peck and Paul's director's cut of The Wild Bunch. Now, the success of this screening showed that there was money to be made on such endeavors. This led to the emergence of other longer versions of classic films, such as Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, which led the way to a wave of re-releases of movies throughout the 70s. Harvey's passion for film and filmmakers led him to have close relationships with not only Sam Peckinpah, but also Robert Altman, James B. Harris, and actor Peter O'Toole. But let's get back to Z Channel. So Harris, a passionate fan of filmmaking, has a cable network and he can program whatever he wants, which sounds a lot like the plot to Weird Al Yankovic's feature film UHF, but instead of putting on shows like Wheel of Fish and Uncle Nutsy's Clubhouse, Harris got his hands on all sorts of amazing cuts of previously unreleased motion pictures, starting with the director's cut of Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. Here's what you need to know about Michael Cimino and the film Heaven's Gate very briefly. Cimino made the critically acclaimed war drama, The Deer Hunter. Christopher Walken, Robert De Niro, and it's a great movie. Movie. Chimino followed up that with Heaven's Gate, which is an epic western starring Christopher Walken, Chris Christopherson, Jeff Bridges, Sam Watterson, Willem Dafoe. The cast is amazing. Production of the movie was fraught with challenges. The release date was repeatedly pushed back. There were accusations of animal cruelty on the set, including that a horse was blown up with dynamite. <laughs> Holy shit. A working cut of the movie was shown to studio executives and it was 325 minutes long. That is five hours and 25 minutes. This this was eventually edited down to 219 minutes, which is still three hours and 39 minutes. Good God. The movie was released in November of 1980, and all the controversy surrounding the film, including but not limited to exploding a horse with dynamite, and I'm also guessing the almost four hour runtime, made the film a financial disaster, and it was pulled for theaters, leaving a wake of bad mojo and irreparable reputations in its wake. Leap ahead a couple of years when Harris over at Z Channel got his hands on the director's cut of Heaven's Gate, and he decided to promote it as the world premiere of the definitive official five-hour epic version of the movie on Z Channel, and he aired it when else, of course, Christmas Eve 1982. Come on, kids, gather around. I hear tell they blow up a horse with dynamite in this movie. Needless to say, this was the most watched movie ever on Z Channel, and so Z Channel continued to show more original, unedited versions of movies alongside foreign films and B-movies and other contemporary films in an effort to compete with the emerging cable networks, HBO and Showtime. Z Channel also popularized the use of letterboxing on television to preserve the screen ratio to the filmmaker's original vision. And both Quentin Tarantino and Jim Jarmusch stated that Z Channel had a direct influence on them as filmmakers. Z Channel showed there was an audience out in the world that respected the directors as an artist and wanted to see their work unimpacted by the film studios and the need to release movies that supported the financial interest of others. The rise of home video in the 80s and 90s created a secondary distribution outlet to reach audiences interested in seeing alternate versions of films that had been released in theaters for wide distribution. Director
directors Michael Cimino and James Cameron both cite the pressures from film studios and the interference of studio executives just coming in and screwing up their original version of their movies. James Cameron went on to release director's cuts of multiple of his films to address the issues that he ran into when it came to making movies the way that he wanted them to be made. Aliens, Terminator 2, The Abyss were all released in home video stores with special editions. Cameron wasn't too fond of the term director's cut, and I guess he wanted final approval on everything when it came to these re-releases, including how these editions were described. The special edition of Aliens included extra scenes that provided more character development that was cut out by the studio for theatrical release. The special edition of Terminator 2 is mostly an expanded version of the original film, and the special edition of The Abyss, which if you've never seen, you absolutely should. Yes, the original theatrical release of The Abyss didn't do very well, mostly because because the studio insisted that the movie be whittled down to an acceptable runtime, which came in at about 2 hours and 25 minutes, a long movie by most standards. The special edition is around 3 hours long, and that extra 30 minutes makes all the difference, not only because it includes additional context to the movie's finale, but it allowed time between the original release and the special edition where special effects technology had improved to a point to where James Cameron was able to deliver a finale that was more aligned with his original creative vision. Ridley Scott's Blade Runner is another example that benefited greatly from a director's cut release. A work print edit of that film's director's cut was screened and extremely popular with critics and fans alike. Warner Brothers, realizing they could turn an extra buck or two, worked with Ridley Scott and released a director's cut of that film in 1992, 10 years after the movie originally landed in theaters. And that director's cut is now considered the definitive version of Blade Runner. Now, not all director's cuts are for the better, and Sometimes a piece of art should just be left alone, and one more stroke of the paintbrush can ruin a masterpiece, or come off looking like a cash grab by the studios, or even worse, by the directors themselves. Case in point, George Lucas and all his special edition versions of Star Wars films that were not only updated and re 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 released in theaters, but for many decades, these new versions replaced the original releases of the films and were the only versions available, resulting in much sadness for many Star Wars fans worldwide wide. Muddying the waters of re-releases and director's cuts are edits of films known as uncut or unrated versions of films. Paul Verhoeven's original Robocop received an X rating due to the graphic violence in that film. Filmmakers released the original edit of that movie that had the X rating, and it had all of the unsavory violence that was added back in, resulting in much happiness for Robocop and extreme violence fans worldwide. But that wasn't really the director's cut of that movie, it was the original edited now don't be fooled by the uncut or unrated labeling of a re-release version of a movie that you like. Normally the filmmakers just toss in some scenes that they left on the cutting room floor, maybe a little extra nudity, maybe some profanity, and it doesn't really do much to genuinely improve the movie overall. Unlike director's cuts, which can have a measured improvement over the film's overall quality. Sergio Leone's 1984 gangster movie Once Upon a Time in America has a director's cut that extended that movie's runtime from 2 hours 19 minutes to over 4 hours, and that version of the movie is much better than the original theatrical release. I personally enjoy Cameron Crowe's untitled bootleg cut of Almost Famous, which includes 40 minutes of additional footage that brings in more character depth, and the movie is better for it. Similarly, Ridley Scott's Kingdom of Heaven has a director's cut that tacks on another 40 minutes of film footage and improved that movie for similar reasons. Richard Donner worked on the OG Superman, and this led to a falling out with the producers of that film series, and he was unceremoniously fired as the director of Superman 2 halfway through production. We covered this story in our episode about Supergirl, see Season 5, Episode 1 to hear more about that. But Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut, was released 25 years after the original version of that movie flew into theaters. The Donner cut includes unused footage from when Richard Donner was still in the director's chair, and this movie is a fun, albeit somewhat unpolished version of Donner's original vision of the film. The movie better explains why Superman gives up his powers. It's not just because he's in love with Lois Lane, it's because in a conversation with his father, Jor-El, that's right, Brando comes back. 
And here, Superman's dad tells Superman that he cannot favor one human over another, and Superman's decision to relinquish his powers is because he has lost the ability to serve humans with any objectivity. Now, arguably, the ending of the Donner Cut is terrible, because just like the first Superman, the use of spinning the Earth backward and, more importantly, making time go in reverse is used again to undo what was just done to wrap things up in a nice, convenient way. It just comes across as lazy writing. I mean, it's a terrible way to end a superhero movie. <clears throat> The Donner Cut is more serious. It is absent the failed attempts at humor that were interjected into the original sequel after a new director was brought in halfway through production because of tensions between the original director and the movie's producers. And speaking of Superman, and serious movies, and failed attempts at humor, and directors having issues with film producers, and a new director coming in halfway through production, Let's turn our attention to a movie that has one of the most famous director's cuts of them all, Zack Snyder's Justice League. When the original Justice League was released, it was filled with controversy, a subject that we covered extensively in Season 5, Episode 4 of this very podcast, where we talked about the original Justice League. Early on, Zack Snyder was picked to lead the effort to deliver a newly imagined DC superhero universe, starting with Superman's return in the big screen film Man of Steel, a movie that portrayed Clark Kent struggling to understand his place in the world in which he truly did not belong. The movie did well enough to herald a sequel, Batman vs. Superman, colon, Dawn of Justice, that not only introduced those two characters, but it also introduced Wonder Woman as the first step into a larger DC superhero universe, as implied by the colon, Dawn of Justice in the movie's title. The response to Batman vs. Superman from critics and fans was not what the filmmakers expected. Across the hall in most cinemas, Marvel was cranking out superhero movies that were real crowd pleasers. Everybody loved them, while DC was delivering superhero movies that were darker and didn't resonate with audiences in the same way. The superheroes in the DC universe were oftentimes not humans who gained superpowers, but rather were immortals or gods who struggled to fit into the world world of humans. Marvel presented characters that audiences could identify with, DC presented characters that could not identify with the audience. With the wheels in motion to grow the DC cinematic superhero universe, Justice League made its way into production in 2016. Rumors immediately began to swirl that Zack Snyder was going to be fired as the director early on. These of course were just rumors, but studio executives did put some watchdogs on the set to keep an eye on how things were going on a day-to-day -day basis. And executives were also a little more hands-on when it came to the script, reportedly nixing a love story between Bruce Wayne and Lois Lane. Zack Snyder completed initial filming and he showed a rough cut of the movie to studio execs. It did not go well. First issue was runtime. Studio executives wanted this movie to come in at an easy two hours. Zack Snyder said, you can't introduce six characters and an alien from space wanting to dominate the world in just two hours. To which Joss Whedon said, hold my beer. Over time, executives at Warner Brothers began to lose faith that Zack Snyder could deliver the goods when it came to the Justice League movie. And then Zack Snyder's daughter, while home from college, took her own life after a long struggle with depression. Zack Snyder left production of Justice League to spend time with his family and deal with this tragic loss. Now, in light of all this, Warner Brothers tapped the aforementioned Joss Whedon, who worked on Marvel's The Avengers, to come over and finish up the project, with notable rewrites that reportedly included almost three quarters of the entire script and sizable reshoots at the request of studio executives. The release of the Justice League was met with less than high praise. Many fans and critics noticed the blending of the vision of two different filmmakers. Comic book fans have very high expectations of how their beloved source material material will, nay, should be captured on film. And this version of Justice League didn't hit the mark. Studio execs had tapped Joss Whedon to save Justice League the movie, and that didn't happen. In a Vanity Fair article about the production of Justice League, an anonymous studio executive said, When we got to see what Joss Whedon actually did, it was stupefying. The robber on the rooftop? So goofy and awful. The Russian family? So pointless. Everyone knew it was. It was so awkward because nobody wanted to admit what a piece of shit it was. 
In the wake of the movie's release, rumors began to swirl that there was another original cut of Justice League somewhere in the world. It was an epic four-hour version of Justice League, perhaps tucked away in a vault, and die-hard comic book superhero fans began to demand that Warner Brothers release the Snyder Cut. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Zack Snyder said in an interview with the New York Times, almost every movie I've ever made has a director's cut. And that's right. Five of Snyder's nine feature films all have director's cuts or revised theatrical release treatments. Dawn of the Dead, Snyder's debut remake of the George Romero classic had a director's cut with nine extra minutes added to that. Sucker Punch had an extended version with 18 more minutes of footage. The adaptation of Watchmen got a director's cut with 24 extra minutes and an ultimate cut that included an animated sequence featuring Tales of the Black Freighter. And arguably, each of these director's cuts, or Snyder's cuts, added footage in an attempt to improve the overall narrative of the film sometimes in subtle ways where scenes were allowed to breathe a bit more. And other times, there were more notable plot points that changed a character's story arc in much more important ways. The Snyder Cut of Batman vs. Superman included a subplot where Lex Luthor frames Superman for a bunch of deaths in Africa. And additionally, Lex Luthor is the one behind the death of a guy that Batman brands with his bat symbol to get Superman and Batman to go after one another. And by most accounts, the Snyder Cuts of these movies are arguably not worse than their original theatrical release, but they don't really present a fundamentally different version of the movie. It's just longer, with more of the same movie packed into a longer runtime. Which brings us to Justice League, the Snyder Cut. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, you most likely know the story of how this movie came to be. If not, here's the recap. Comic book and movie fans clamored on the internet to release the Snyder Cut of Justice League. And with the launch of the HBO Max streaming service, Warner Brothers gave Zack Snyder some extra money and more creative freedom to deliver an alternate version of his original film. As mentioned a bit earlier, it's not unusual for directors to get kicked in the ass and shown the door when their creative vision or control over a movie gets out of control in the eyes of the people putting up hundreds of millions of dollars to make this movie. It is unusual for a studio to allow someone with whom they've severed all ties to come back into the fold and given a second chance to produce a movie that could be whatever they want with no restraint on time limits. What Snyder produced was a four-hour film that would never have been released in theaters, which begs the question, was this truly the movie Zack Snyder set out to make for theatrical release, or is it something different altogether? Zack Snyder's vision of this DC superhero universe is uniquely his. Snyder was the architect of a dark, somber, and brooding world that would later be the home for The Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey, and reportedly, there's a future feature film starring The Flash in this world. In an interview with the New York Times, Zack Snyder said he actually edited multiple versions of Justice League, and each of them was considerably shorter than the one available on HBO Max. And as an artistic filmmaker who creatively approaches their work, looking to imagine and reimagine and re-envision the final product in an effort to tell the best possible story imaginable is in and of itself a wonderful journey of discovery and exploration. With the release of Zack Snyder's Justice League, he had the opportunity to tell the story he originally wanted to tell and let fans of the DC superhero universe see his epic interpretation of good versus evil and finally let comic book fans be the ones to decide for themselves if his vision is a magnificently marvelous movie or a fantastic film flop. And I know such a comic book fan who is eager to give his thoughts on this streaming cinematic opus. And so let's get Pick 6 Movie Zone Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to break down this movie scene by scene by scene by scene by scene to see if it's any good. Ladies and gentlemen, Wonder Women and Supermen, we cordially invite you to enjoy this, our 100th episode of Pick 6 Movies, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Trumpet guy, do your thing. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies 100th episode. We have a live studio audience for the very first time ever in their soundproof booth. Bo, you look fabulous. 
fabulous in your tuxedo. I don't think I've ever seen you actually formally dressed up. You look like a million bucks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've lost some weight. You look great. I feel like I'm glowing. This is bittersweet for me, Chad. Are you retiring? Are you pregnant? Were you pregnant? No. <laughs> But what is bittersweet, Chad, is that it's the 100th episode, and that's really exciting, and, and I couldn't, on a, on a personal note, I could not be more proud of this show. I could not be happier with the people who have come along uh, for the ride and make dumb pictures and make up movies and stuff along with us uh, on all the social media, and that's, that's a lot of fun, and it's super flattering, and I love everything about this, but then we have to talk about <laughs> Zack Snyder's Justice League, and... <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me want to put my head in an oven. <laughs> As noted in the introduction, Bo, this movie was made under very difficult circumstances. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, excuse me, point of order. Um, yeah, I think the discrepancy I have with the introduction <laughs> is that you say comic book fans wanted this movie. I disagree, sir. I believe who it was that was clamoring for Zack Snyder's Justice League was none other than Zack Snyder fans, not kind sir comic book fans. We respect the Richard Donner vision of Superman and will accept no substitutes, no matter how many black suits you put on them. Point of order, sir. There are exactly four, I count four, Zack Snyder fans registered on the internet, and I do not believe that they would be capable of concocting such a social media shitstorm of demand for such a motion picture. Yeah, uh, attorney Leghorn is right. Yeah, I I do think, uh, all joking aside for the next three sentences, I think that it, it truly is people who were kind of into this vision of the DC universe. And that's not a small number of people. I don't mean that. But I think the Venn diagram of comic book fans and like DC EU fans or, or the cinematic universe, the DCU, I guess, I think that isn't necessarily a one to one Venn diagram. I think. I think it was a situation where the rumors of this movie existing and then people are like you're keeping something from me well god damn it i want to see it right now it doesn't really exist oh of course you would say that like no really that the movie doesn't exist <laughs> i hear you get it on streaming services now look for a number of reasons i was disappointed that i heard this was really coming out <laughs> one because i knew that probably at some point we would watch it but also, I don't like movie studios capitulating to fans. I think fans can have all the crackpot fan theories that they want to. I just don't want the studios to bend the knee because I believe that there's like an artistic integrity to this. It's the, the whole reason that I think all those Star Wars updates are, are kind of crap. Just let the, the piece of art be what the piece of art is, even if the director maybe was shortchanged a little bit. Yeah, like I said, you put it on a DVD, that's fine, but going back and shooting whole new scenes and all that stuff as happened with the Snyder cut I'm just like oh just I, I don't want this to be the precedent I don't want the fans to have that much of a vote because fans are stupid but here we are uh, on this momentous occasion staring down the barrel of four hours worth of Justice League I also just want to say on this podcast we goof on movies that's what we do and this movie was made under very unusual terribly tragic circumstances we buy we in no way are going to undermine any of the complicated details that underpinned this movie making its way to hbo max but having said that we're about to spend the next two and a half ish hours good god if we're lucky goofing on this movie so buckle up we're gonna have a good time all right my plan chad i took i took a roofie a little bit ago so i should have a good time on the show and the good news is i'm not gonna remember any of it tomorrow let's talk about the aspect ratio of this movie i like to call it the kiss my aspect ratio <laughs> it is presented in this four three ratio to preserve Zack snyder's vision of having a movie that could make its way to imax theaters so you could charge a little extra for each ticket or maybe if you wanted to go back in time and show it on tv in the year 1987 this movie is four hours and two minutes long it is the longest movie we've ever reviewed on this podcast and it will be the longest movie we ever review on this podcast unless we do that heaven's gate five hour cut <laughs> i hear they blow up all horse with dynamite in it that's the smoke on the street or the horse chunks <laughs> on the street as it were let's get this done with because i don't know how long i've got before i just pass out from the roofies our movie opens up and we get dc's answer to marvel's flipbook opening we see batman 
Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Cyborg, The Flash. Then Green Lantern zips in real quick in this montage of characters, which I was like, is that the rank order you would put these characters? Because I would put Superman first, then Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Cyborg, then Aquaman last. Because Aquaman is to the Justice League what Meg is to Family Guy. What are you even doing right now, huh? Blowing me up right right out of the gate? Casting Jason Momoa as Aquaman certainly put a different face on that character. Originally, he auditioned to be Batman. Sure. But it was actually Zack Snyder who was the one who made this casting decision to make him Aquaman. So you got Zack Snyder to thank for that. And well, you know, everything else is his fault as well. But still. Yeah, it's probably the best decision made is having Jason Momoa as Aquaman. I would, yeah, I would probably put Aquaman last in the DC character. Canon. Like, I'm wearing, believe it or not, Chad, for this occasion, I'm wearing a Batman t shirt right now. Under your tuxedo? Uh- Uh, That's right. You can see the bat signal just peeking out here. Green Lantern isn't even really in this movie, nor all of these other characters that slip into this final Vanity Fair Oscar-esque photo that they show at the beginning of the movie that includes Catwoman and Shazam and Supergirl and a whole bunch of other characters that normally just live over on the CW. I like the Shazam stuff a lot, though. In terms of their cinematic efforts, I think Shazam may be the best DC movie. No maybe about it. It's the best. That's a DC movie they made, in my opinion. It's the most entertaining. I would uh, still watch the original Superman any day of the week, but... Oh, no, no. Um, I'm talking about modern day films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Aquaman was dumb and bad. Yeah. You know, there is a (laughs) Green Lantern in this movie, not the Green Lantern, not like Hal Jordan at at all. But if you blink, you miss him. Well, in, in this version, there's some business with a Green Lantern, a member of the Green Lantern Corps. And I'm sure it's a named character, but just, I mean, who could possibly care about the Green Lantern? I certainly can't. I'm sure those people do exist, and God bless you, like you're doing the Lord's work, picking up the green lantern and by darkest night keeping that franchise alive our movie opens up and we see a space rock flying through where else bo space Uh and there's an arrow through a rock or maybe it's a heart and then we see superman with a hole in his chest where his heart is or where it was and he's screaming in pain and it's slow motion because this is a Zack snyder film but then back on earth we see lois lane and she's looking all sad and she does this in a lot of these uh, uh Zack snyder movies And then we cut over to Wonder Woman and she's on the ground looking up at a green bolt of light that rises up in the sky around this red bolt of light. And then we see Batman. He's hanging out and he's being useless because he doesn't really have superpowers. And it turns out, Bo, we are at the end of Batman versus Superman, where Superman has sacrificed his life to kill this creature. Abomination. Lex Luthor made a General Zod monster. That sounds bad. From the umbilical fluid or whatever of the the kryptonian spaceship that will later be used in this yeah. and yeah it's them just watch it as superman eats it r.i.p superman yeah and also r.i.p abomination like you said he sacrificed himself to kill abomination abominations dying as well you think they had to call some from the from the city to like pick up abomination with a like a backhoe <laughs> or something put him in a dump truck taping over to the dump just burp, burp, i think it's more burp. of a like <laughs> <laughs> You get one of them machines that just like claws cliff faces and whatnot, and you just start hacking them up to burn them right there because the place is already devastated. Also, you don't want to take chances on it coming back. You know what they need to get? They need to get some dynamite and blow him up like they did that horse. They need Michael Cimino in charge of that public (laughs) works project. Listen, guys, hear me out. I've got a little experience in this. You say a big animal needs to go away? I think I got you. You want to see my resume? Go to YouTube. You ever seen that whale what got blowed up on the beach? That was me. My inspiration was <laughs> Thomas Edison and the elephant. We cut to Cyborg, who's a new character in our movie, but we never met him before. And Cyborg, he hears Superman's final scream, but it's not really a big deal in Cyborg's world. Cyborg's just chilling out in his apartment and he hears all this clatter. He's like, maybe that's Santa Claus. But it turns out he looks over and the clatter is actually a mother box rattling over in a nearby closet, but more on that later. I like the fact that Cyborg's life is essentially Sigourney weavers from copycat like he just doesn't go outside anymore just hangs out in his place looking out the window probably has a couple of online chats going on in the background i think it sounds like everybody's life these days now that i say it out loud (laughs) yeah 
My agoraphobia knows no bounds. Superman's cries of death and pain, they echo all around the world. We cut over and we see Lex Luthor, who is chest deep in muck, where he created Abomination. Then we see Steppenwolf putting together three mother boxes as a vision around this primordial ooze. I don't really know what's going on here at all. Did you? I think, Chad, this is sort of a 3D YouTube how-to video. Oh. Say I wanted to destroy the world and then it shows you well step one here's what you do you got to get three mother boxes you combine them together and you make it into the unity now do me a favor smash that like button comment <laughs> below and we're going to be giving away a thousand dollars to one of the lucky viewers who subscribed in the next 24 hours Stephen wolf here <laughs> if you for the low price of 29.95 i will come to your planet and <laughs> i will find those mother boxes and i will enslave you that's right go over to only fans and i'll show you my dick well, at least until October. That was really a good second job for me, I gotta say. It. <laughs> Look, everyone knows they're gonna make a new platform. We'll just move over there, but <laughs> it's really, I'm gonna lose some followers. And that's the name The name of the game's likes and followers. I don't know if you knew that. Anyway, and, uh, what, uh, just be sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you on the other side of this. We cut to Aquaman Town, and they hear Superman's final scream, and all the mer people are like, hey, what was that? And here we see another mother box is vibrating. And then... And off in Wonder Woman world, all the Amazonians, they have a mother box and it vibrates. And one Amazon warrior approaches and she touches the shaky box and it kind of cracks. So something's up, Bo. Yeah. Also, she. this is the one who immediately is like, hey, somebody go tell the queen. By the way, don't tell her I touched it. Just tell her that the thing started spilling light out of it and so, bouncing around on the pedestal. You know. Did you, you said tell her you touched it? Okay. No. No. Wait, 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 wait. Look. I didn't actually touch it. Like, I was almost touching it, and then it started doing its thing. I didn't actually touch it. I mean, that's crazy. If she asks me if you touched it, I can't lie to her. So You're not lying. You're not lying. From where you're standing, you can't see it. This is all a perspective thing. You can't see around the corner of this box, and it was jumping around. Everybody can attest to that. So I never touched it. I got close. I got so close. I mean... A real, a real pussy hair away, Chad. <laughs> we cut to a kettle on a fire up in the mountains, and we see what appears to be Han Solo riding a tauntaun up in the snow-covered hills of Hoth. <laughs> and it turns out that it's Batman romping around in the snow in Iceberglandia, torturing a horse uh, in this frozen land of death. I thought these smelled bad. On the outside. Batman's dressed up like Bruce Wayne right here. And he makes his way to this small fishing village. It's got to suck to live in this fishing village. There's no phone. There's no lights. There's no motor car. There's not a single luxury boat. Mm -hmm. It's like Robinson Crusoe. It's as primitive as can be. I see what we're doing here. Fade to black. Part one. Don't count on it, Batman. What are we doing here? What, what was that cinematic preamble? Just part zero. Who gives a shit? Part Point five, none of that matters. I don't think you can do a late title like this if you're breaking it up in the chapters. No, it's a chapter right off the bat. Otherwise, when this, like you said, when this happens, I'm like, well, then what? What was all that? <laughs> Could I have skipped that? Was that like the author's notes that, like, you know, the, thanks to my editor Kirby? And I'm like, I don't give a shit about that. Give me the book. Looking back on this film as I made it, I realized. No, 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 no. Chapter one. That's where I want to start. I ain't starting with, with the, the prologue. <laughs> Batman shows up in this fishing village. And there are these people there that are way too attractive to be living in this remote hamlet next to a frigid sea. They all look like that they should clearly have missing teeth, of which none of them do. Batman rolls inside this building and he hands this guy a business card, which is an asshole move. This local reads it and he's like, Bruce. But why? I'm like, dude, you need to go to an adult literacy class. All right. The joke of the scene, essentially, uh -huh. in this utterly humorless film. Yes. Is that Aquaman here is playing translator to this blonde weirdo who might be king of the village. Yeah, for the day. That's how it works. Every day it's a rotation. Yeah. Aquaman is like, oh, uh, yeah, he uh, wants to know who you are, bro. And... <laughs> Batman is like, tell him that I'm looking for someone. I'm going to form an alliance. He's like, sorry, bro. That ain't what we do up here. Uh, you can just beat it. Hey, I'll tell you what. Uh, you want to do some shots before you go? And also, how about you throw some money in the jukebox? Hey, you're the guest. I believe there's a stranger 
who comes to this village from the sea. He comes in the winter when people are hungry. He smells of Panama Jack suntan lotion. He loves the white stripes. He's a fan of chicken wings and Coors Light tall boys. Do you know this man? Hey bro, it's been four months since a ship got through the ice. Sounds like you're just wasting rain in Margaritaville, amigo. You know what I'm saying? I'll tell you what, bro. Uh, I got a couple of tall boy CLs behind the bar that came special here for me. Total coincidence, brother. Uh, how about you and I crack one of those and you have a drink, hit the road. How about that, huh? You hit the bricks. There are enemies coming from far away. I need warriors. Uh, I wish I could help you. I do. But this guy has got to listen to some sad music, grab some whiskey, and hit those waves. I will give you $25,000 right now to talk to this man. Is that a lot of money to you people? I have no idea. I am a secret billionaire. I might be a trillionaire. I don't know how much money is. I, I tell you, brother, uh, you were barking up the wrong tree. It's a total fish-based economy. I don't mean that these people just sell fish. It's what they eat. It's how they barter with each other. Unless you got 25,000 cod, you are SOL, my friend. Everybody in the shack starts giggling after Aquaman whispers something in Icelandic. I think it had to do with living on sponge cake and watching the sun bake. Yeah. The head Icelandian, he says, how dare you speak to us like children? We are poor, but we are not stupid. Get out! And then Aquaman steps in and he's like, yo, bro, I think it's high time you ski daddle out of here before I got to get physical. Look, I'm nice unless it's time to not be nice. You know what I mean? That's from Roadhouse. It's my favorite movie. Okay. That or any which way you can. A movie that is far superior to the original every which way but loose, if you ask me. So look, let's just say you vacate the premises, mysterious rich stranger. And also I'm about to throw you up against the wall. Nothing personal. Just keep my rep in check. All right. Cuthunk. Whoa, 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 brother. Before you get out of here, I just had a brilliant idea when I was thinking about every which way but loose and Roadhouse roadhouse all at the same time what if you could use them computers to put sam elliott in every which way but loose how about we make that movie we're remaking this one why not huh i'll tell you what let's celebrate with a couple of cls how about that we swap out the orangutan for i don't know what about jar jar binks tell you what screw every which way but loose you put them in any which way you can. Now that movie's <laughs> as good as the original, brother. Batman whips out $25,000 and money talks and bullshit walks. So Aquaman and Batman leave. Outside, Aquaman says, hey, brother, look, no hard feelings about, you know, me manhandling you inside. And by the way, you like that idea? That Jar Jar Binks, Sam Elliott thing? I just, I can't stop thinking about it. But anyway, hey, for realsies, are you Batman? You dress up like a bat? That is cool as shit. I thought about dressing up like a fish one time and between you and me, I did it once, but but someone said I look like Charlie Tuna, and I got real drunk one night, passed out. They sharpied black glasses on my face. It was embarrassing as shit, bro. Listen, before I bail, first of all, I know you got the money to do this any which way you can thing. I'm going to be waiting for that phone call, brother. But you got to check this out. As soon as I hit these waves, these people are going to sing this crazy-ass Mothra song. Talk about how awesome I am in some crazy language. I don't even understand it. I was just fucking around with you inside. Anyway, brother, it's good to see you. I like the bat thing. Uh, I'm take, taking this whiskey with me. Before you take off your, your sweater, there's a fight coming. And I need you, Aquaman, to join the fight. When the fight comes, will you join us? Brother, listen, I got to tell you, Aquaman looks out for Aquaman, all right? I am better off alone. There is a saying, one person is stronger than a bunch of people. I think that's a saying. It doesn't matter, brother. All that matters is I got the waves. I got the whiskey. That is two W's that I like. Aquaman, for you, do you know Superman? Because I, I, I know Superman. And um, I was with him when he died. And um, I don't tell a lot of people this, but my parents died when I was a kid. And I heard through the grapevine that your mother died when you were young too. And I was just curious, is your mother named Martha? You know what? Forget I asked that question. If, if it is, it's only going to complicate things. Just forget I even said it. Let me ask you this. If I said yes. Just don't say yes. Does that mean you leave? Is it? I think it's Patty. I look, I got to tell you, man, I don't even know. I just called her mom. It's, that's not the kind of shit I commit to memory. I got a lot on my mind, man. I'm ruling the waves. Look, I'm about to, I'm about to whip off this sweater, head into the ocean and be badass. Wow. You are sculpted. Look at that. You're a god among men. I mean, I wear a suit just to really, you know, accentuate muscles that aren't there. But you, you are a specimen, my friend. Check this out, brother. I got one of them tattoos that when I'm ripple my muscles, it's a middle finger. Huh? Huh? <laughs> 
pretty awesome. All right. Peace, everybody. Everybody looking good. I really like the fish thing. The song is kick ass. See everybody later. Bye-bye. Kersploosh. About this time, the village is outside. All of these spinsters are singing this song about how they're never going to get married and their lives are miserable. One of these women goes over and picks up Aquaman's discarded sweater and she gives it a real... I get it, man. I mean, did you just see that dude? Holy fuck. I would give that thing a sniff myself. I just, what does he smell like? Oh my God. I can tell you what he smells like. He smells like testosterone and an Abercrombie and Fitch store. I mean, those are two great tastes that taste great together, Chad. A Sousant of Coors Light. Just a, like undertones of course Light. Well, that's what he spilled on his, on his sweater. <laughs> right. Right. That. Well, that's part of the sweat, really. He's... <laughs> sweating out last night's 18 we cut to ma kent who's looking all sad at night and she's at a graveyard and she's saying her final goodbyes to the grave of clark kent her son and then she hops in this beat up blue ford pickup truck which is pulling a u-haul as she rides off she's done lost the kent farm Bo. yeah thanks for closed on it where's she going this is the most Zack snyder ass moment in this movie for me of like if you ask him like, hey Zack snyder you're taking Taking the story of Superman and the Justice League. Just out of curiosity, is uh, Ma Kent going to be in it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, she sure is. Well, what's Ma Kent up to in the in this crazy comic book adventure? Well, uh, she's packing up with her sad dog <laughs> to get out of town because the bakes foreclosed on the farm after Superman was fucking murdered. But where does she go? Just, uh, homeless. You know, like I think later she's like in the soup kitchen, slept there for a night. They, they said. Maybe she drives around to local industrial parks and beats people up for money a la any which way you can we get her in the sam elliott remake with jar jar binks the dog replaces clyde this is all coming together hey 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 let's not muddy the waters too much all right brother because <laughs> it's supposed to be just you know sam elliott jar jar binks all right mall can can be there too that's all right we cut over to a tarmac where a helicopter lands and batman pops out still dressed as bruce wayne alfred his butler comes over and says master way it's certainly cold here in Iceland. My peeny is quite teeny due to the frigid temperatures. I found Aquaman. I saw him naked from the waist up. I've got to start hitting the gym five days a week. This guy is a bronze god and he lives in a climate where the sun is out two days of the year. Also, he told me to piss off. He's not joining the League of Justicians. I'm still kind of working on the group's name. That's just awful, Master Wayne. Listen, how about you move from this helicopter to this giant jet? I know it seems like the helicopter could just take you there, but whatever. And so it appears that we are not for two. Not for two? Who's the other person? Was it Superman because he's dead? It's not Wonder Woman. She's on board. I don't understand the math on this one either. But anyway. We cut to a coffee shop where Lois Lane is still looking all sad. And she leaves with two cups of coffee. And we hear more sad music. It's really suited for a funeral. It's raining. It's all slow motion, of course. She gives a cup of coffee to a cop sitting in a patrol car. Turns out this is her routine. And she walks over and she gives him a cup of joe. And he's like, hey, Miss Lane, good to see you. I wasn't sure you was going to show up today. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm sad all the time. I just miss Superman so much. <laughs> We got to a couple of white vans. And, Bo, we hear some menacing music. Some shit is going down, Bo. Bad guys jump out of the van. They're all dressed in black. Just think Blues Brothers convention, but with more guns and ammunition. You know they're bad guys because they immediately shoot the security guard outside the bank in the fucking head. Is it a bank? I didn't know where they were. I was like, maybe it's a bank or a museum or a college or a fancy movie theater. I don't know where they are. You're right. I think maybe it is a museum. I, I guess that would make some sense but you know i don't doesn't matter anyway they so there are kids inside yeah and then the, the leader of the bad guys he gets on a phone and he says if i say any funny business i'm gonna kill all these kids and then we cut to outside and there's immediately 100 cops and also are we in england Bo? because the chief of police has a british accent it doesn't look like new york i don't know where we are ever in this movie you paid for the chapter titles how about some cities and locations you and know just once just an insert here like london okay great because the dc universe is not set in a normal geographic world they actually show us city skylines of cities that we recognize but then they suddenly 
subtly say like oh this is central city and the thing that'll throw you is they mention like new york or manhattan on a newspaper cover and it's like okay so are we in manhattan or are we in metropolis or is there no metropolis is there i know there's a central city and that's flash's joint and w- we talk about gotham and we we're in gotham a little bit the daily planet is in metropolis wouldn't that be where superman's memorial is located i, I yeah it the geography of this like this is one of the reasons that the movie's just kind of generally shitty is that for <laughs> all the money that got spent in fixing it they forgot to fix the simple shit of like who what why when and where they forgot that part of it we see wonder woman perched atop this golden statue and she sees that something's going down ground level and then back inside the museum bank college campus movie theater a bad guy opens a briefcase and bo it's full of bomb there's bomb everywhere yeah and he starts a countdown clock and all of these children gasp and the head henchman turns around and says i said shut your fucking mouth I'm like whoa I, I like his line here down with the modern world back to the dark ages <laughs> and and so we know that as terrorists their idea is that they're gonna blow up this museum or whatever that's their plan just blow it up i guess that's gonna bring attention to the cause like i don't know what cause the of bringing everybody back to the dark ages they want to get rid of technology but i don't understand how this is going to accomplish it it's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i guess they're just crazy people that again this is a who what why when where problem of like i don't understand who these characters are to contrast the beginning of the dark knight which is one of the best comic book movies of course the beginning of that is this whole bank robbery i know it's a bank i know that it's a robbery <laughs> and i also am following these kind of clown thieves as they're kind of crawdadding one another throughout the scene and it's really engaging as opposed to this where it's some jerks with a bomb that is going to do something somewhere i don't have a problem with that setup in a superhero movie that exact same plot device is used numerous times in spider-man movies for good or bad it's like oh these are bad guys they're up to no good spider-man's gonna go get them but in a movie like this it really feels like all of the elements of character behavior should be stitched together rather than just a bunch of random thug shit going on. Yeah, we know Wonder Woman is a hero because she jumps in and kind of saves the day against these terrorists who want something somehow. It just lacks clarity. It just feels kind of messy. She lassos one of the goons when she shows up and she yanks him up and she says, who are you? We're a bunch of terrorists who want to turn back the clock on progress and we're going to blow up four city blocks while the world world watches and like okay so the bomb has 30 seconds on it wonder woman burst into the room and we get some slow motion bow that actually makes sense as she is able to dodge bullets left and right and i like gal gadot as wonder woman i like the rapid speed of her beating the shit out of these thugs she grabs the bomb she leaps into the air she explodes through the ceiling tosses the bomb it blows up and wonder woman comes back down to earth uh counterpoint i don't like any of these action scenes and i don't particularly care for her as wonder woman (laughs) i liked her in the wonder woman movie i didn't care for wonder woman 1984 i thought that that was a muddled mess but i do like her in this role but let me also say i'm comparing that to the other idiots that surround her and she's really the valedictorian of summer school in this movie yeah i'll grant you that the the wonder woman standalone film i think is pretty okay i don't think it's a good movie i think it's an okay movie and her character is just written to be much more likable and have some depth to her and that never happens in this movie and like you said 1984 is just a train wreck so i i just don't care about her character and also i just don't like these action scenes i i, I think the slow motion loses its impact when so much of the movie is in slow motion for her and the flash it makes sense for everything else in the movie it should go away because it's you're just diluting the effect too much i think fair enough the head henchman back in the bank museum college campus theater i can't tell if it was jake or elwood he picks up a machine gun he just starts spraying bullets at these children but wonder woman crashes down she deflects all the bullets one by one and then she clashes her bracelets together and causes an explosion that just blows jake or elwood out of the wall of this building sending concrete and debris down on the street below quite possibly injuring some of the officers who are outside trying to just do their job and then a little girl walks over to wonder woman and she says 
can I be like you someday? And Wonder Woman says, you can be anything you want to be, which that's a lie. Mm -hmm. This little girl cannot be Wonder Woman when she grows up. Absolutely not. Unless she experiments on herself and then she becomes a supervillain that ultimately would fight Wonder Woman. But here's the other thing, Chad. She vaporizes that terrorist. Yes. Just vaporizes him and his like derby hat floats down along with the concrete. And that's another reason I hate all this Zack Snyder garbage is like, I don't want to see Wonder Woman just straight up murdering people at the opening of the movie. He tried to kill children, Bo. You bring him to justice. You don't fight fire with fire. That's not superhero. That's my kind of justice. I, I know you and a lot of other fans who hashtag release the Snyder Cut the, the way to all of this. So they should have gone full Sin City and ripped his dick off. This is just how it's not for me. I just don't want to see superheroes murdering people. There's a line Batman has that I'm like... This is not Batman I ever want to see. Why is this a thing? <laughs> so we cut to Amazonia, where one of the mother boxes is there. It's sitting on a rock pedestal in this domed building, and it's surrounded by like 500 Amazon women who are all pointing bows and arrows at the box, just waiting for some shit to go down. And the head Amazon warrior, she comes in. Her name is Hippolyta, yeah. Yeah, And she says, has anything happened today? And another Amazon warrior, her name is Menapoli. She says, no, my queen. And and these jobs of just standing there aiming a bow and arrow at a box, that's got to be the shittiest job in Amazonia, right? It's got to be up there. You just stand around all day and stare at a thing? Uh-huh. I mean, good work if you can get it. The mother box cracks, and the mother box begins to rattle, and a pillar of light appears from the sky down into the domed building, and then all of these flying bug men, these parrot mm. demons, they come zipping in, and here we meet one of our movie's bad guys, Steppenwolf. Close your eyes, girl. Look inside, girl. Let the sound take you away. Dun, dun, dun. The Amazons then just immediately gang tackle Steppenwolf, who looks like a giant silver bull with his armor. He's a horned demon that kind of looks like a radial tire inspired sculpture of the devil that one might <laughs> find on the lawn of someone who takes joy in pissing off their neighbors and homeowners association. Yeah, basically the front lawn from Cool as Ice, that dude with all the crazy <laughs> clocks and weird sculptures and stuff like Steppenwolf wolf belongs there <laughs> stephen wolf says i've come to enlighten you to the great darkness i will bathe in your fear there's a little bow and arrow action. There's a bunch of flying demons that do battle with Amazonians, and it's a battle royale. You can't tell what the hell's going on left and right. This dome building falls into the sea, and a bunch of Amazonians die, and they made the building fall because they cracked a bunch of hammers, and there's chases on horses. Characters we don't care about end up dying. Long story short, Steppenwolf gets the mother box. He disappears, roop, up his space tube, and the queen of the Amazonian says, we have to light the ancient fire. Wonder Woman will know what it means. Fade to black. Yeah, I do like Steppenwolf just picking up horses and throwing them in this. Speaking of blowing up horses, he doesn't so much blow them up as just punt them, which is, is pretty fun. All of that happens. We go to part two, which is called, Chad, The Age of Heroes. Fade in. We're in this desolate town near a cooling tower. This city's seen better days. It's all abandoned and in shambles. My first thought is that this is Chernobyl in Russia. One of Steppenwolf's travel tubes blasts down to Earth and and then shortly thereafter, out pops Steppenwolf. And he says, It smells toxic. Mmm, that's good. He's clearly the kind of guy that when you fart near him, he looks over and goes, Nice. I like the smell of skunk. I just do. It's a thing. Also gasoline. <laughs> Steppenwolf plugs the first mother box into this broken stone monolith. It oozes out orange goop and then out blasts what looks like a glowing tree root that expands out and it ekes up the sides of the inside of this nuclear waste cooling tower, which that's where we are, right? Inside the cooling tower? Yeah, this is where he's setting up shop. And he does a thing where uh, he inserts the, the mother box that he's got. Number one of three. The one of three into to this steel structure uh, inside the the cooling tower and it kind of infects the reactor and the land outside with this you know alien tentacle rock thing and then he, he tells the pair demons like 
Go, my pretties, fly, fly. (laughs) (laughs) Bring me the mother boxes and those ruby slippers, too. And then he says very cryptically, he will have to see my worth now. Yes, I haven't learned how to see my own, to trust that I am worth something as a person or celestial being, but uh, now is not the time to work on that. I have a job to do. He lowers his head when he says all this, and you're like, is he talking about his dad or his secret crush? We have a complicated (laughs) relationship. That's what my status on Facebook says. Complicated. (laughs) That's what it is. We cut to Batman, and he's shaving his face, and he looks over at Alfred, and he says, What about that kid? The one from the liquor store. Yes, Master Wayne. It looks to be young Barry Allen, but honestly, you're running yourself ragged building this team, all because Lex Luthor says the world is in trouble. This doesn't have anything to do with Lex Luthor. I made a, I made a promise to him. I, I promised, I'm not gonna cry. I promised him oh, on his grave. It's too much time dividing us. Gotta bring them together. Redemption, absolution. I miss my mom and dad so much. Oh, all right. I'm better now. I'm gonna hold it together. <laughs> Master Wayne, are you sure you wouldn't just want to drink? You can really stamp a lot of these feelings down with drinking. That's my experience. We cut to a shot of the Chicago skyline. Is it Chicago? Is it Second City? I think it's Gotham because Gotham has always been an analog to Chicago in a lot of ways. We cut to this high-tech office building. Here we find Dr. Silas Stone. Turns out he's Cyborg's dad if you're scoring at home. So Dr. Cyborg's dad, he leaves work and he's walking out and he says goodbye to a janitor. And then a little later, there's this explosion in the research laboratory and the janitor janitor of course just walks inside he finds a hole up in the ceiling and he also finds a parademon who is looking for one of the mother boxes and then this janitor just gets either eaten or abducted it's kind of hard to say right now right you're not clear on what happens here there's just a scream and you know we get a long shot down the hall to suggest that something fiendish has happened inside the lab we cut over to amazonia where they decide they are going to have to light the wonder woman signal to to let her know that some shit's going down. So the head Amazonian, she fires this lit arrow into the air and it lands back in the mainland on some ancient ruins in our world and sets them on fire. And then we cut to Wonder Woman who's at her day job restoring ancient artifacts in France. Is she in France? I don't know where she is, but on TV, everybody speaks English because, you know, of course they do. She sees that the Wonder Woman signal was lit, some shit's going down, and she looks a bit worried, Bo. Yeah, she's dressed to the nines for brushing dust <laughs> off of statue or whatever you dress for the job you want Bo, not the job you have i runway model i guess is what she's going for (laughs) within the museum so when she sees the signal fire hit the you know so-called shrine of the amazons she whispers invasion she knows what's up we cut back to dr cyborg's dad Uh who shows up as people at the lab are investigating this break-in what what the hell what kind of breaking and entering has happened at my work? Yeah, and a couple of the cops are like, uh, yeah, I, I got a couple of questions for you there, uh, Dr. Cyborg Stat. Uh, uh, all right. What, what kind of questions do you have have for me? Uh, there's this case here. If you found my fingerprints here, it's because I work here all the time. I, I'm not up to anything suspicious at no, all. No, no. No one's accusing uh, anything there is suspicious, Doc. Good. Good. Uh, but Good. Can I have a cigarette? Sure. Uh, Lenny, give him a cigarette. Look, yeah, we found this box here. Uh, looks like it's been here a while. Uh-huh. And yeah. uh, it mm-hmm. says item 16892. Uh-huh. None of us know uh, what the heck that is there, Doc. And Oh, that, that was stolen a long time ago. I mean, it, it was misplaced. Huh. That was misplaced like weeks, months, years ago, before I even worked here. I've never even seen that trunk in my life. And whatever was in it is certainly not illegally in my apartment. Uh, sounds good to me. Lenny, uh, you want to give us a little tour around here, Doc? I'm a little busy right now. I think I need to go to the bathroom and throw up because I'm really nervous. Thanks for not being suspicious, Doc. You, you really set our minds at ease also uh someone got a a sketch of uh whatever kidnapped this janitor guy look here it looks like uh my two-year-old drew the batman (laughs) it was this official sketch 
Terry. Is this our official sketch? Yeah, we gave the guy a box of crayons. The guy what saw the, the thing that came in here, and that's what he drew. He was also sitting in a puddle of his own TT. We sent you the, to that whole class there. You were supposed to learn how to draw, like how to sketch from the way that people describe somebody. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't give it to the trained artist. We just gave it to the guy that saw the, the monster or whatever and just told him to draw, and that's what he made. Did we bring the other guy? Nah, he got fired. He's a pedophile turns out oh boy he was drawing pictures of little kids naked oh boy i gotta talk to my cousin and then somebody ripped his dick off like they did in that movie sin city oh yeah that was good elijah wood with them reflective eyes scared the hell out of me we cut to dr cyborg's dad entering his apartment he goes in doesn't turn the lights on and he starts talking to cyborg and dr cyborg's dad says the box isn't safe here a, a bunch of cops came around my work looking for it also a monster showed up at my work looking for it which mo it's charming that an adult well-educated character in this movie can say a monster showed up at my work and it not be signs of early onset dementia <laughs> yeah yeah i guess that is one of those rare occasions where you talk about the monsters <laughs> at work and no one's taking you to the psyche or cyborg turns around and he says beep pop boop you know a lot about monsters don't you dad especially how to make them boop pop beep burn these two got friction and then we see the other mystery mother box over in the closet just kind of you know rattling on its own yeah so we we get out of there to check in with wonder woman who is now investigating the shrine of the amazons because apparently the, the fact that it was suddenly on fire wasn't a big deal and it's just open to the public again <laughs> She wanders around and just improvises a torch. She hops down to this little cave below and she places the arrow that she found at this crime scene into this arrow-shaped hole on the wall. A mystery door opens. Inside, there is art on the wall explaining that the mother boxes and that there are flying insect parademons. The music gets all heavy. There's a painting on the wall that reveals our movie's main bad guy, Dark Side, but we don't know that yet, unless you're like us and you sat through this awful thing twice. And Wonder Woman is looking very concerned at this picture of dark side and she says again invasion no she doesn't say a word because why would you give this character anything to say we cut to the ocean uh, and it's rough waters and it like it's a, a ship that is going down this sailor is calling for help the waves are too big i'm gonna die out in the water hey i got you bro we cut to this bar in iceland where aquaman strolls in with this screaming fisherman over his shoulder he drops a guy on the table orders a drink of whiskey and says hey bro look tell your buddy here he's got to respect the storm you respect the sea the sea respects you all right that's a aqua mantra registered trademark all right i got that on a t-shirt if you want to buy it you know and a beer cozy mouse pad go to aquamantra.biz all right you can get all your aquaman merchandise needs fulfilled online couple of clicks free shipping boom in your mailbox within 48 hours all right? also brother gotta tell you about a little venture i got it's called aquaman array it is my brand of tequila personally this guy it is certified by aquaman to get you effed up also if you want to have that wonderful aquaman stench about aqua velva man you can get that online too all right it is my own personal brand smells like abercrombie and fitch Coors Light sweat and a little special ingredient I like to call a spit. What I say is there's a little bit of Aquaman in every splash. And that's a God's honest truth. That is a mixture of a couple of my bodily fluids. Not a lot because, you know, brother, I got to stay hydrated. You see this body? But I do squeeze a little out for the little Aquaman out there. That's what that's that's an Aquaman promise to you, brother. I'm going to give you a little hint. One dab behind each ear, one on your taint. Trust me. It'll be like your your birthday, New Year's Eve, and your bar mitzvah all at once, all right? I'll tell you, a lot of people will come up to me, they'll be like, Aquaman, I just do the ears, man, I ain't touching my taint. Brother, you got to get comfortable with your body, and you got to rub your taint. You do, you are going to come straight up to me next time, and you are not going to say a word, brother, you're just going to high-five me. And I get it, you don't have to say a thing. What you have told me with them five digits is you went to the taint, and the taint treated you right, like I knew it it would because i wouldn't have said it the first time if it wasn't awesome everything i say and do is awesome as soon as you wrap your head around that you're gonna enjoy the taint 
You're going to enjoy the ears, and you're going to enjoy the attention you get. Aquaman grabs a bottle of whiskey and walks out of the bar in, what else, slow motion. As all this sad-ass music plays, he goes over to the sea, and the shoreline is crashing with waves. Aquaman polishes off this bottle of hooch like Bluto Blutowski, and then chunks it into the sea. Litter bug. Aquaman does his best to kind of take off his shirt, but the water crashes around him, and he just disappears into the ocean. And then Aquaman he zips down to his home world under the sea and it's all crumbling and he meets up with Willem Dafoe who was his mentor in the Aquaman movie again I saw that once I don't remember anything about it and Willem Dafoe looks at him and he says well 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 if it isn't Spider-Man I mean Aquaman the man who would be king son of the human father and queen of the seas all the time I wasted trying to keep a promise to your mother you're the rightful heir of Atlantis the mother box our people god is not safe take up your mother's trident spite aquaman brother i got the perfect response check out this tattoo then flex that's right brother wait a minute that's a middle finger are you pointing that at me so long weirdo aquaman out and these two part ways yeah we got back to steppenwolf at his cooling tower lair and he facetimes with a character named desaad who i think is dark side's number two and desaad says mm, steppenwolf um have you begun the conquest no well you could have sat by the side of the great one but your self-pride hmm got in the way just saying and everyone here they agree with me and by the way you are the great one like mm, i don't know like fifty thousand more worlds or something like that anyway he will hear your pleas when you pay your debt so get your shit to work call me when you have good news other than that don't want to see well yes i am working on paying off the debt can i talk to him anyway uh i don't think so hold on a moment let me check and see is he here mm, no i don't think so okay so how many more worlds do i need to conquer just like 50,000 at a minimum. 50,000 worlds. Oh boy. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. All right. Well, let me get to work, I guess. Uh, you know, for Dark Side. Mm -mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Bye bye. He thinks he's hung up. I can still hear him. I think he's crying. He's such a baby. Listen. I just wanted to talk to Dark Side once. I just want to tell him I'm sorry. Wait, is that thing on? Son of a Desaad! We can totally hear you. Oh my god, you're such an asshole. All right, I'm hanging up for real. You better even show me how to turn this thing off. He doesn't know how to turn Shut up! The monolith. <laughs> Shut up! And so then we go to Wonder Woman, who has found Bruce Wayne's not Batcave, but just secret hangar where he's working on a jet. <laughs> what are you doing with that jet? You know, we have to be ready for when the aliens come. There's going to be an invasion coming, Wonder Woman. I'm trying to get everyone together for that. What is this thing you are building here? It, does it roll? Does it fly? What it, Are you building this by yourself? It, yes. It, Do you have a degree in engineering or aeronautics i'm i always assumed i could build a jet i just i'm putting engines and wings yeah uh, there's a, a cockpit which always makes me laugh a little that looks like it's made of cardboard when i look at it did you spray paint that yes i spray painted that that's what makes it aerodynamic you know batman i once knew a young man who could fly he could probably fly this but he died he came back uh in the 1980s and his ghost inhabited the body of another man kind of like how patrick swayze did Whoopi goldberg in the movie ghost hmm. i had sex with that strange man's body with the dead ghost of my boyfriend from world war one inside it was the 80s, though. Sex, cocaine, evil masterminds, Kristen Wiig in a wasted role as the cheetah. Come to think of it, that man's body I had sex with in the 80s might have been HIV positive. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? You know what? Let's look to the future and not the past. Shall we change the subject? You say there's an invasion coming. Well, listen to this story that I have for you with an epic flashback, Batman. Oh, boy. I like cartoons. Then we cut to this Lord of the Rings world where we're in the long, long time ago. And we see that there is an attack from Darkseid against the Amazonians and the Atlanteans and the Guardians from the Stars. And Darkseid shows up and he looks a hell of a lot like Thanos. And he takes this big long-handled axe and smashes it on the ground and produces a giant henna tattoo on the face of the Earth. And then Wonder Woman starts providing this voiceover where she says, As Darkseid was busting up the joint on Earth, he found a hidden power in the infinity of space or something 
making something. Mother boxes, indestructible living machines made from a science so advanced it looked like sorcery. The three boxes joining together create the unity, which cleanses the planet with fire, forming it into a copy of the enemy's world. All who live to serve Darkseid, alive but drained of life. So, uh... Can you climb into these boxes? Or perhaps build a fort with them? No, Batman. They have unimaginable power stored inside them. The kind of thing that could actually power your giant spray-painted cardboard black ship that you have behind you. I'm not going to lie. That would be very awesome. It would be, wouldn't it? We get some shots from the editing room floor of 300 during this flashback where the Atlanteans and the Amazonians and the Middle Earthians and the citizens of Wakanda, they all run in to try to kill Darkseid and his alien ne'er-do-wells. At one point, a Green Lantern shows up and zips around shooting emerald lasers from his magic ring to give all the nerds watching this boners. That was so awesome. Did you see? That was a Green Lantern. He, oh, is he going to come back later? He better. He doesn't? Shit. Mom, I need more pizza rolls! Guys, did you see that the ring shot off into space so we could seek out the next Green Lantern? Wonder Woman goes on to say, This was a golden age of heroes with Zeus and Aquaman and Amazonian women and that one Green Lantern guy from space all fighting side by side to defeat Darkseid before the mother boxes united. And then Darkseid just gets his ass handed to him. His flying bugmen, these parademons, they all carry him to safety and they put him back on his spaceship and he flies off and and then the three mother boxes are given to each group of people on Earth to hide. One goes to the Atlanteans underwater, one goes to the Amazonians, wherever they live on an island, and one to the Earthlandians, or whatever they're called, which are just the normal goofballs walking around on Earth. And the Earthlandians <laughs> just take their box out to Miller's Crossing, and they bury it in a shallow grave like a bunch of pirates hiding treasure. I was surprised they didn't slap a big comical red X on top to find it when they came back round. You can't bury me out of the woods like an animal. <laughs> Come on, Tom. Have a <laughs> Have a high Tom. Still my second favorite Coen Brothers movie. Uh, of all maybe time. my first now. I, I've watched that movie a lot lately, and that movie Raising Arizona will forever and always be I, my number. I one. totally get that. I I understand it's got such a special place in my heart as well. Miller's Crossing is just so damn good. Oh who hit you? Somebody hit you. <laughs> John Polito in Miller's Crossing is pitch perfect for what that movie is. The way that John Polito says, Bunny Bone Bow. <laughs> I love it. Love it so much. What'd you eat today? Hot dog. What else? Hot dog with mustard. <laughs> you eat that. <laughs> <laughs> so wonder woman finishes up her narrative and she tells batman oh right so dark side he is back and he's looking for the three mother boxes again oh that sounds bad we've got to stop him you know like the way those people did in that story you just told me about we could maybe fly my machine up into the sky and beat up dark side and all his bug men we will need the others where are they oh uh the others yeah F funny story um you're going to laugh when I tell you that one. There, uh, there are no others. Whoopsie. Fade to black. Part three, beloved mother, beloved son. Uh-huh. Boy, this is going to be a downer, Bo. Well, the, the movie's been so sunny up until this moment. That chapter title sounds like it's more suited for a tombstone engraving of a tragic murder-suicide. Absolutely. Th <laughs> this is the side-by-side -side headstones of a mother and her infant found dead of carbon monoxide poisoning in a tenement building. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but I am. Also, we're an hour nine minutes into this movie, and other than the brief introduction of Aquaman and a quick drive-by sighting of Cyborg and this generic setup of a bad guy from space and the mother boxes, really nothing has happened in this movie that didn't occur in the previous DC superhero movies. I mean, it's nice to see Wonder Woman kick ass, you know, Lois Lane is all sad, missing Superman, and Ma Kenton is down on her luck, but nothing has really occurred to create the plot of this film over an hour plus of the movie you know you could have stopped at nothing has happened in this movie i know uh, <laughs> and guess what we're gonna spin our wheels for a little bit longer before we get to anything because we've we've got to do an origin story for this shithead we fade in and there's a signpost that says we're outside central city why did the movie suddenly decide to start giving us geographical landmarkers i don't know i should be grateful i'm not <laughs> because nerds can be like 
Oh, you guys, Central City, that's where the Flash lives. The population of Central City is 1.4 million people, slightly larger than Dallas, a little smaller than San Diego. In walks to our movie, The Flash, dressed up as his alter ego, Barry Allen. And immediately, Bo, I do not like this character because he leans down to pet a dog and that dog barks back at him in a menacing fashion in slow motion. If a dog does not like a character, character in a movie at first sight there is something suspicious about that character right and the implication is that what is off about barry allen is everything that he is possessed of the speed force but it said it's just like oh ow he nipped at my fingers a little oh geez i i think this dog maybe doesn't like me so much but most dogs do the flash gives the stink eye to this dog and he goes into this pet store where he bumps into this cute girl who's exiting and he proceeds to stare at her with this look that would fill any human being with fear for weeks he looks like a stalker who is sizing up how your skin would look on top of his skin. Yeah, if he doesn't have a shrine already built to this woman, it's a matter of days. It's meant to be a love at first sight moment, but it really comes across more of a 911 what's your emergency moment. She does give him a look back as she's on her way out, but she she goes to get in her car while the Flash is applying for a job by pulling out the most torn, busted ass application out of his pocket where he's, oh geez, I just, I filled out the application that I put in my uh, wallet and I washed it. I put it here and then there's probably some kind of monster in my pocket that chews up my little uh, resume. I'm like, why are you talking about the monster in your pocket? Unless you're applying for a job at an adult bookstore. Yes. You shouldn't be talking about that. Also, the cute girl that he bumped into, she goes out on the street and when she gets into her car, it is a convertible that has the top open. And you do not park a car like this on a major city street ever. You come back, you're going to find six people in the back who now have squatters rights you're just gonna have to drive around with these random crazy people in your car (laughs) sounds like we're gonna get some motherfucking chinese food larry (laughs) call back to curb your enthusiasm i know (laughs) also if you're getting a job at a pet store you don't have a resume that's you have that piece of paper you fill out front and back you know that has like you put your mom as your primary contact if they need to get in touch with you anyway so the cute girl she gets in her car and she can't get it started and then we cut to a delivery truck and it's heading down the road and the driver drops a hamburger on the floor he reaches (laughs) over to pick it up so he can he can eat it and some tensions building the pretty girl pulls her car out into the street the guy looking for his hamburger ain't paying no attention the truck driver crashes into a hot dog vendor's car and then the pretty girl girl t-bones this delivery truck and everything slows down all right point of order chad all right just to quell my own issues with this scene in your life have you ever been eating something in a car dropped it and thought well, I can finish that. Peanut M&M's. Oh, you're a monster. <laughs> How could you possibly? That's where people's feet straight from the road have been, Chad. That hamburger falls on the floor. That hamburger's gone. You got to go back through the drive through That's all there is to it. I don't know. I've been in my car and I drop a peanut M&M and then I polish off the bag. I'm driving along and I'm like, you know, there's one more down there. I'm like, hey, I can see it. <laughs> that's That's the behavior <laughs> of an addict. <laughs> I'm not denying any of that. (laughs) (laughs) I got a wicked peanut m and problem, and it it does not stop at the floorboard. Not at all. They're delicious. So this car T-bones the truck, and then Zack Snyder slows everything down for us in a way that here makes more sense, according to you, Bo, than what we saw with Wonder Woman. So inside the pet store, the Flash sees this is happening, and he uses his super speed powers and rushes outside as this modeling cover of Song of the Siren by Rose Betts plays. The Flash ex- 
explodes out of his shoes, uses his finger to explode the front door of this pet store, and he snags the cute girl from the air before she face plants into this truck because she is airborne and is somehow in front of her car, which, wait a minute, that's why she's in a convertible, Bo, so this thing can happen. I get it now. Right. While he's saving her, he also sees a hot dog from a hot dog cart that got hit by the sim a lot of hot dogs Bo, are flying around there are wieners everywhere he reaches out <laughs> to grab a hot dog and so i'll have it and mm, i got all my glasses and my shoes now i've got a wiener so are these kosher i hope these are beef are these hebrew national i hope that they are Oh, she's such a pretty lady. Look at her. Yeah, puts her on the ground, folds her arms over her chest, and then the car flips and explodes. Like, flips over the semi. Dude, it blows the hell up. It's a pretty good explosion. Meanwhile, the Flash is back in the pet store, only he is in a pen full of puppies with this hot dog flopping around. Oh, this is crazy. In the city? By the way, I always carry hot dogs in my pockets for such an emergency do i get the job do i start on monday i like you i'm hired and i guess he's hired she should call the police is what ought to happen because she just busted his window this poor woman is just talking to this weirdo Mm -hmm. and then in the span of about what a second and a half her front door explodes and this guy's sitting over there feeding rando dogs hot dog chunks there's a car on fire in front of your store there's just been a major accident in front of your store and this guy's response to that is total denial of what just happened outside your window so that he can feed some puppies and i guess that's a devotion to the animal shad but it also expresses to be a detachment from reality that is dangerous why is the flash getting a job as a dog walker why is he not a pizza delivery guy that would make more sense or is that just too close to peter parker's job in that second toby Maguire spider-man movie where the car crashed through the window in slow motion and almost killed mary jane oh yeah i knew this scene reminded me of a better movie yeah a lot of that'll happen with this <laughs> when you first see steppenwolf and he gives the i'm here to bring the darkness you know all that shit it's the scene where loki zaps into adventures and says i'm burdened with terrible purpose yeah that scene was way better when i saw it the first time when it was in the avengers we cut to the ocean <laughs> yeah. where some parademons are dragging a bunch of atlanteans up onto the shore and steppenwolf marches over and says you stink like a mother box where is it and this guy won't tell him so steppenwolf bounces him off a rock and then puts a mind reading spider on his head and this guy ends up foregoing some information so steppenwolf knows the location of the second mother box cut to lois lane in her apartment going through a box of superman stuff and she's still all sad good god they have nothing to do for lois lane in this entire movie other than to stand around and be pretty it is terrible it's a it's such a shame to waste amy adams's time back at the bat warehouse it's not the bat cave we get some unwanted flirting between batman and wonder woman these two are not romantically involved or interested in each other in any way in this movie other than this awkward moment in the film yeah where yeah they touch they're double clicking on their Miz house they're looking at this underwater footage of aquaman and there's security camera footage of the flash stopping a liquor store robbery and somehow they have footage of dr cyborg's dad building cyborg and wonder woman says batman you go talk to the flash i will go talk to the cyborg so off they go to try to recruit these two for their superhero squad i like when she talks about the atlanteans i don't know bruce they are untrustworthy and i hear they spread covid you know so like there's a tinge of racism in her discussion of atlanteans that i wish there was a bigger deal about but she there it's clear it's like yes the the atlanteans took all of the good amazonian jobs for a while it was we were happy to see them go into the sea we cut to a city apartment building where cyborg is watching some kids play football in the street cut to a slow motion football game in the snow where cyborg is the quarterback and then we cut to a scene where the school principal tells cyborg's mom excuse me his doctor cyborg's mom thank you very much that 
Your son may be the school quarterback. I mean, he's clearly the handsomest 28-year-old man in the entire high school, and he's a certified genius, but he can't hack into the school's computers and change his friend's grades. Yeah, because there's nothing more relatable as a character, Chad, than the superstar high school athlete who's also a super smart computer hacker. That is everybody's experience in high school. Dr. Cyborg's mom says, excuse me, his friend's family loves lost her house last year and my son helped this girl because he has a good heart and he wanted to get late you know the reason most 28 year old grown ass men still in high school do anything what did you do to help this girl and the principal's like i'm sorry dr cyborg's mom i I didn't mean to make you upset and there's more slow motion garbage as he scores a winning touchdown in the snow time runs out you're the greatest ever he looks into the stands where his mother is like slow motion cheering because of course it's all in slow motion that's my baby there's a seat right beside her that might as well have a like a name tag on that just is reserved for <laughs> dr cyborg's dad <laughs> Cut to them driving home after the big game. And Dr. Cyborg's mom says, baby, you want to stop off and get a drink? And he's like, no, mom, (laughs) I don't think I want to do that. You know, baby, your father got caught up at work. He wanted to be here, but he has difficulty showing you that he loves you because he loves you so much. And Cyborg, he's all sad. And immediately, bam, they get Mm T-boned on Dr. Cyborg's mom's side of the car. And she's dead. Right. Dr. Cyborg's dad is told at the hospital, the doctor comes out and says i'm sorry uh we did everything we could but he died before i could see him the uh the bad news is your wife is dead the good news dr cyborg's dad is that your son (laughs) is partially alive the lower torso like below the belly button that part was completely squooshed one of his arms is gone half of his head most of his fingers on the other hand his spleen one of his kidneys up oh, both kidneys um one of his eyes we were going to save him but then we pressed down on his chest and he said to blave which as we all know means to bluff <laughs> and it was our assumption that your son ended up in this state as the result of a card game gone bad So we come back to the apartment and Dr. Cyborg's dad is there with Cyborg. He's now got his glowing Terminator eye and he's got his glowing Iron Man red chest. And Dr. Cyborg's dad says, you know, we could still live a normal life, you and me, son. And Cyborg says, beep, bop, boop. If you came to my slow motion football game, dad, and then maybe my Dr. Cyborg's mom would still be alive. This is all your fault, Dr. Cyborg's dad. This is all your fault. Son, you know, those slow motion football games take four and a half hours. I don't. I'm a research scientist working on an alien spacecraft. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. I can't. I'll tell you what. You videotape it. I'm going to play it four times faster than it happened in slow motion. And then I'll watch it. I'll tell you what. I, I've got it all here on this micro cassette recorder. I'm just going to leave it with you. And I say some stuff. I, I got to be honest. I steer clear of talking about that slow motion football. That is extremely long. So he leaves this tape recorder and walks off. Cyborg goes over and hits play. And we hear Dr. Cyborg's dad say, you know, your strength is just the tip of the iceberg of your powers. And then outside, we see Cyborg learning to fly in his cyborg suit like Iron Man. And we get an overview of his powers that he can tap into any information grid anywhere. He could launch a nuclear arsenal if he wanted to. He could manipulate financial markets. Cyborg then goes into his mind palace where his father gives him all kinds of worldly advice. In this mind palace, Cyborg is tapped into the world's computer system and he sees this waitress on security footage and this woman is struggling to make ends meet it's very unsettling how he has video of this same woman at work on the street then in her house and this lady's all down on her luck and she gets evicted as he's going through all this footage she can't pay for her baby's formula so cyborg decides to put a hundred thousand dollars in her bank account which why stop at a hundred thousand dollars yeah that's just enough to get you out of immediate trouble yeah give her give her 20 million yeah this movie's so stupid i also here's another thing i particularly hate uh when cyborg's dad is doing his jarell because that's what this scene is it's just superman in the baby ship and jarell being like you will be powerful kal-el um 
Mm-hmm. It's when he's talking about the stock market manipulation. And to drive this point home, Zack Snyder and his team of digital wizards have a computer bull and bear just fighting each other. Rawr. Well, that's what they do at the stock market. It hurt my head. It was so insulting. Then a bunch of parademons show up outside Cyborg's apartment because Cyborg has one of the mother boxes inside. Then forget that moment of menace as Cyborg hears his father on the tape recorder say, Cyborg, I need to talk to you for a moment from my heart as your biological father and then cyborg just crushes the tape recorder in his big metal hand he's angry with his dad bo in fact bo every single character in this movie has either daddy or mommy issues every single one of them hell the objects of desire in this movie are called mother boxes yeah sometimes a crappy movie is just a crappy movie chad but sometimes it's a a revealing look at the director's psyche the Flash goes to prison to visit his daddy, who's all locked up. And here the Flash exposits, ah, Oh, I'm here visiting my father who was convicted of killing my mother, which he didn't do. And I'm working four part-time jobs to pay for my college tuition and criminal justice because I want to get my daddy out of, out of jail. And Flash's dad, as played by Billy Crudup, is like Harry Dean Stanton from Red Dawn. You gotta get out of here, boys. I'm gonna drag on your life. Don't come see me again. I won't see you. But you're my dad. I need you to go. If you tell me to leave, it's going to reinforce all my daddy issues and my mommy issues. Because, you know, you supposedly killed my mom. I don't know what to do. And then a guard just grabs Billy Crudup. Let's go, Flash Dad. You're out of here. And he's just like, avenge me, boys. Avenge me. This scene ends with the Flash saying, "Uh, the Flash, you got to quit living in the past. You got to make your own future. Hey, that sounds pretty good. Maybe I should do that at the end of the movie. He goes across from the prison across a train yard to his secret lair where he inserts a fuse and turns on some lights and lo and behold there is the batman dressed up as bruce wayne tell me about this image of you at a liquor store where a robbery was foiled boy oh geez uh that's not me that's just a very fast gentleman that looks like me and i my hair is not that long batman walks over to this mannequin and it's wearing the flash's superhero costume and he says the suit it's silicone based and he resistant i know you have powers also it is red and red is fast oh yeah look uh I like to do competitive ice dancing. That's funny, right? That's why I have that costume. Look, I don't, I don't know who you are, but whoever you're looking for, it's it's not me. Dude, the Flash needs to stop talking in this movie, and I will stop hating him more. Batman is just like, I'm really tired of this conversation. And so he just whips a battering at the Flash's head. And of course, everything slows down, and the Flash is like, oh boy, look, it's a battering. Hey, hey, you're the Batman. Oh my god, you're my third favorite superhero in the world. Whoa, you were really fast. That's very cool. Would you like to be in my club? Oh yeah, I need friends. I annoy people. Just ask the audience. They're confirming all this. They hate me. As they're leaving the building now that he's on the team, he's explaining, I've got to eat like 4,000 calories a day. So they get in Batman's car, and this is the kind of trailer moment where the Flesh says, So what is your superpower within? And Batman says, I'm rich. Oh, that's just not really a superpower. Don't can't you can you fly? Huh? Can you read minds? What do you what it what like what makes you so great to be the Batman? You just got money? Pretty much. Also, can you go get me a pizza real fast? I mean real fast. Like grab me one and come right back. I gotta call Spider Man. He can do that. So Wonder Woman, meanwhile, takes off the kettle in the bat lair or something. Uh huh. While Alfred is like, Oh look, you're doing it all wrong. Yeah, he mansplains how to make tea. Yeah. She says, well, if you are so smart, what are you doing over there? And he says, oh, well, I'm making these bat gauntlets that capture alien laser energy and then store and reflect it. I'm also looking down your blouse. Oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Right. It's like, when was Alfred the super genius? All right. Fair enough. And then Wonder Woman says, I want you to make me a lasso. Black, of course. Wink. Because everything in this movie is black. Because that is our palette. She goes over and hops on one of Batman's supercomputers and she's trying to track down Cy- 
cyborg, but then things go all wonky and there's a message that comes up in what looks like the clippings from a magazine that a crazy person would use for a ransom letter. And it says, meet me here now. So Wonder Woman takes the advice of the bonkers computer and she goes to this location to meet Cyborg in her Mercedes. Superheroes in this movie, they like to drive Mercedes. Well, like you said in the introduction, the, these are not stories about, you know, men who become gods. There are stories of gods who just happen to be among us mortals. And they're completely unrelatable. That's one of the problems with, I would argue, Zack Snyder movies as a whole, uh, short of Dawn of the Dead. Cyborg flies in and he lands and he goes, beep, pop, boop. Why are you looking for me? And Wonder Woman says, we need your help. The world needs your help. Beep, pop, boop. Fuck the world. I don't need anybody. And I'm like, whoa, 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 cyborg. What's with the body mouth? Yeah. Kids are watching this. The whole speech is about like, you have these gifts and you have to open back up to pain, even though it might hurt. You should hear the story of Steve Trevor. Did you see that movie? I shut myself off once. In the 1980s, his spirit inhabited a strange man's body like Patrick Swayze did to Whoopi Goldberg in the movie Ghost. Did you see that? Beep, pop, boop. I never saw that movie. I don't need anybody except for my Dr. Cyborg's mom. Who's dead? Why did you have to die, Dr. Cyborg's mom? Why did you have to die? I miss you so much. He flies to her grave, Chad, and there's his own headstone there. Beep, pop, boop. Mama, I just miss you. Why do these two share a headstone? There's no place for Dr. Cyborg's dad to be buried. Maybe he made that decision as part of the funeral arrangement. Yeah. Till death do us part got it it turns out that cyborg has buried the mother box used to create him in the his empty grave oh is that what happened yeah i just saw him kind of digging it a little few feet deep and i was like well that's not gonna end well he dug up a vampire here in salem slot cyborgs dig up bodies all the time <laughs> we get to dr cyborg's dad's lab where his lab assistant is workshopping some stand-up comedy as these two discuss this mystery metal that gets super hot none of his jokes are funny because this is a Zack Snyder movie and they're completely out of place. The lab assistant asks Dr. Cyborg's dad if he thinks that Batman is involved in the mother box being boosted. Dr. Cyborg's dad says, nah, it's not him. So we come back to the apartment and Dr. Cyborg's dad, he comes in and he finds the tape recorder all busted up. The mother box is gone. Cyborg is gone. And then Bo, a parademon shows up. Grabs him and off they go. Then we cut to at least a welcome face. Yeah, J. Jonah Jameis. I mean, excuse me, Commissioner Gordon shows up. I like to think of him as whiplash chad why did they cast jk simmons in this role because I mean, jk simmons makes everything better and even yeah, though but, he, but he, they don't do anything with it i don't care it, for this brief moment chad you gotta give this to me i was like oh there's jk simmons and finally something to hang my hat on but he does nothing i, uh, I he's still a favorite ghostbuster <laughs> There's a deep cut. Yeah, yeah. If anyone recognizes that, feel free to drop that into the, the chat on Facebook. So once again, he's like, I think it's so funny that you'd be asking me about this mother box. I mean, I don't have a mother box. That's so crazy that you would ask me. So C Commissioner Gordon has this stack of messages that he just throws away like a good civil servant. Uh, as another cop is telling him like, yeah, you're not going to believe it, Commissioner Gordon. There's all these crazy people saying that flying bats with things are flying around grabbing people and you don't think it's you know oh uh, look i'll talk to the batman all right all right that's all i'm saying hey can i come that would be really cool like, i could no, tell my daughter come. idiot get downstairs practice your drums uh -huh. one two three four up oh, not on my tempo one two three up oh. mm -hmm. We come back over to the cooling tower where Dr. Cyborg's dad gets plopped down by two flying parademons. Then we head to the airport where Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Batman are all chit-chatting. And then the bat signal shows up in the sky and The Flash annoys the audience more by acting like a total hump. And he's like, oh, look, it's, the, it's your signal. I mean, shh, it's the bat signal. It's so cool. You should probably go now, the Batman. Oh. You're my second favorite superhero of all time. Second favorite? Who's your first? Well, I don't want to say it in front of Wonder Woman, because she might think it's her, but it's Superman. I love him so much. Hey, Wonder Woman, this little weirdo thinks you're really cool. We cut to underwater in Atlantis, and the mother box there starts to crack and wiggle. Mira, who is the leader of the Atlanteans, or, or a leader of the Atlanteans, she shows up to see what's going on. The box cracks, it shakes some more. A space tube comes down from the surface. Steppenwolf shows up to do underwater battle with all of the Atlanteans. And then Steppenwolf kills some guys, beats up Mira. Then Aquaman shows up to save the day. What is up, everybody? 
your body. I heard there was a party going. To- oh, wait, this ain't no party at all. You looks like you boys are in a bit of a scrap. You picking on my old lady? Why don't you pick on somebody with six pack abs and a six pack attitude? Look, we ain't together anymore or nothing, but hey, uh, these are me and mine. All right. We got to we got to clear out. All right. If you look like like my man patrick swayze said there is a time to be nice until it's time not to be nice brother and you have just crossed that line <laughs> aquaman and steppenwolf they fight for a bit but steppenwolf he gets the mother box whoop, off he goes and aquaman gets beat up pretty good yo bro not cool all right that guy sucker punches me i didn't think we were fighting for real man i thought we were just you know roughing it up a little bit just kind of you know two biggest boys in the neighborhood i thought that was it couple of jabronis all right <laughs> Just having a tussle, putting on a show. I mean, I've been drinking. I assumed he had because of the late hour. I don't want to bring it up, but today's mom's birthday. All right. I mean, uh, my dad, my dad left me on the doorstep when I was a kid. I mean, my mom was a fish, you know, I'm angry with her. My dad was a fisherman. Kind of wish, wish there was a support group for people like me to go uh, share our tragedies and tribes. Maybe, maybe someday I can find a league of friends. Maybe friends that are just a bunch of super, super guys. Give me a little personal justice that kind of league who am i kidding only friends i got make me feel better jim beam and jack daniel speaking of which hey whoo it's drunk o'clock everywhere and i'm out Boom. mira tells her like it is your responsibility to stop this threat and he's like i don't think so brother i mean i know you're not really brother i know we kind of did a couple times but I don't yes, want... I, yeah, we did we did i tell you what you are a freak I've been around now, and you you bring something to the table. I had a little bit too much to drink that night. Aquaman. I would say it is the right amount, Mira. I regret everything, Aquaman. Everything. I got to tell you a little secret about Aquaman. Please don't. I got myself one of them eidetic memories. That means I remember every single detail. You couldn't even recite the alphabet when we got pulled over that night. I was drunk. It don't work then. I mean, I thought you were some kind of scientist. You ought to know that. Cyborg comes home and finds his dad has been abducted. (laughs) And then he sees the bat signal. I'm like, is Cyborg in Gotham? Okay. Yeah, fair enough. And then cut back to Steppenwolf, who is putting the second box in the middle, whatever. Uh There's more of this infection on the landscape. And all of a sudden, a red force field comes up as well. Then Dasad, our second in command, pops back in to get a status report. So, Steppenwolf, how are things going? How many worlds or planets have you dominated since we last spoke? I mean, I'm still on the the same one, Dasad. So that would be zero. uh, One. I consider it one. Have you dominated this planet yet? I mean, we're... 67%. 67%. That's a that's a C. That's a zero. That's a average. If the answer isn't yes, it's probably no. He hasn't dominated any planets. I I've, I've dominated almost 50 this I've only got 50,000 more to do. You know Desad. Look, this middle manager bullshit. It's really mm-hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. up to my horns with it. I'm sure you are. Look, I'm going to find the third one. That's a done deal. Uh That's happening. Uh Totally happening. Yeah. And then I will, you know, unite the boxes. It's going to be great. Uh Uh, You can can tell Doc's side to go ahead and start packing up. It's it's totally a thing. It's totally happening. A couple of red flags came up on your last round of expense reports. And we're going to need to set up some time to kind of go through those, okay? I'll, I'll tell that's fine. Uh, right now, I'm going to go interrogate some prisoners. I'm very scary to them. Uh, yeah, okay, that sounds good. How many times in a week can one man go to Hooters? Look. He goes there all the time. Oh, I like their wings, all right? Oh, I thought you'd hung up again. I forgot he doesn't know how to hang up the monolith. I do know how to hang up. Jeff, hang this up right now. So the movie fades to black. Part four, Change Machine. My favorite David Bowie album. I thought we were heading to a video game arcade and having that satisfying pleasure of putting in a $5 bill and hitting the jackpot of 20 quarters. Go play some Donkey Kong and Burger Time. You know, they have the cards now, Uh, which is not nearly as satisfying. I would really like to go back to tokens. We cut to a rooftop where Commissioner Gordon is waiting for the Batman uh, as the bat signal 
Bale is bouncing off the clouds. And then Batman shows up and we're a good two hours into this movie. And this is the first time you really get to see Batman and all of his fancy little dressings. Wonder Woman walks into frame and she's ready to come in second place at a Wonder Woman lookalike cosplay contest. And then the Flash shows up in his red doodads to make us dislike him even more. And Commissioner Gordon asks, how many of you are there? Open your eyes, old man. There's three of us. One of them could have been invisible or something. You can't count on these people. That's a good point. Batman says, oh, oh, there's not enough. You're a real glass half half empty kind of guy, aren't you, Batman? Commissioner Gordon says, look, Batman, there's a drawing that uh, I'm guessing was done by a five-year-old child with crayons. It looks like you, but you didn't abduct people in Metropolis, did you? Because if so, I just lost 20 bucks to Mahoney and Homicide. No, it wasn't me. Uh, Can I see that picture? Oh my God, that was scary. All right, don't show that to me again, even if I ask. Wait a second, let me look at that one more time. I told you not to show me! Wonder Woman says, These are parademons. They have found the scent of the final mother box. They have abducted eight people to find out what they know. And Batman says, Uh, so, Wonder Woman, you're saying that all these people were abduct-taped? No, I said abducted. That's what I said, abduct-taped. These eight people were probably still alive, bound with gray duct tape on their wrists and across their mouths. Duct tape! It's made from ducks, you know. No, that is... Uh, all right, let's... There's probably a nest of these around here somewhere. That's a nest of ducks! They make that tape! Commissioner Gordon, can you do anything with him? I cannot seem to explain anything. I can't do anything. To be honest with you, I thought he was the one who drew this picture with the crayons. I mean, look at it. Look at him. I thought it was a self-portrait. And then Cthulk Cyborg shows up to say, beep bop boop it's nine people. They took my dad, Dr. Cyborg dad. And Commissioner Gordon says, Christ, I need to take an axe for this bat signal. All right. Look, <laughs> we got a map of all this weird shit going on in the city with all of these parademons, you called them. Look, there's no pattern. Jim, 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 you're in way over your head on this one. Look at hey, one. Uh, there's a robot. There's some some woman with a rope. I don't even want to know what, what's going on there. And, uh, and that Batman just getting dumber every day. Jim, you got to call somebody. You got to get some. You got to get this off your plate. I could have retired three years ago. Why don't I retire? I hate the job. I love the job. I love the job. I hate the job. Buy a boat, go to Miami, and just fish. Just fish, Jim. You can do it. You know, I just think back to what my dad said. Just don't don't deal with weirdos, Jim. Yeah, I'm thinking about my dad. Thinking about my dad. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh. <laughs> Look, uh, O'Leary, I'm going to be in my office for a minute. I just need to be alone for a minute with me and my old man. <laughs> cyborg or wonder woman one of these two who has a nickel worth of sense in their head says the parademons are let's say it's wonder woman the parademons are down in the steam tunnels and batman says i like steam duck let's go down there commissioner gordon he turns back around after thinking about his dad and everybody has disappeared except for the flash and to make us dislike him even more he's like oh geez they left me here vanishing somewhat rude. I know I should probably go. I'd look like a damn fool. All right, look over there, Commissioner Gordon. It's your dad. And then the Flash zips off. And so we cut to it down in the tunnels uh -huh. where Batman's got this super tank. Uh, Wonder Woman and Flash and Cyborg are riding along with him. These train tracks in this tunnel, they find this Star Lab ID that lets them know that, hey, some of these abductees are there. We're close. I can smell them. I can smell death. We must be close to the nest. And Batman calls Alfred. He's like, Alfred, this is Batman. You know the superhero Batman? Yes, I know who it is, Master Wayne. Go on. Do me a favor. Can you go and find my iPhone and locate it and find where I am? Because I think we're lost. Well, you know what? We got a computer guy. He's probably got GPS on him somewhere. Hey, you got GPS robot guy? Beep, boop, boop. I got GPS. He's good. He's good. He's got GPS offered. All right. You just, hey, but keep an eye on my iPhone. All right. And stay, hey, stay away from my computer. Don't look at my history. All right. Okay. Uh, Master Wayne, I'm going to hang up now. All right. I think he's going to hang up. So they sneak in where they find uh, Steppenwolf interrogating the janitor from earlier. Uh -huh. And this is where Dr. Cyborg's dad kind of speaks up. Don't hurt that man. And they're like, hey, you know, you want a little piece of this interrogation? And Steppenwolf is like, all right, let's see what you know. You have the stitch of mother box all over you, or is that aqua velva? They smell very similar. Oh, boy. I sure miss Superman right now. How about everybody else? What are you doing, The Flash? You're surrounded by superheroes, and he's just like, don't you wish Superman was here to take care of all these bad guys? What are we going to do? We're just regular ding-dongs. I have no faith in myself. 
Cyborg, seeing that his dad is in danger, flies in to save him. Wonder Woman is like, well, I guess he Leroy Jenkins does. Let's get going, everyone. And so she joins in the fight. Now the fight is on. Batman jumps in. He's like, hey, any of you parademons want to go bare knuckle Donnybrook style? And that's what he does. He's punching these parademons that have laser shooting guns. I'm like, why don't they just shoot Batman? I was like, oh, because he would die. <laughs> right uh, yeah well and he's absorbing i think some of the stuff with his gauntlets right and the flash runs over and he's like oh are you the hostages come with me i'll escort you up the staircase use the railing so that you don't slip and fall left foot right foot <laughs> left foot right foot there he goes now he's doing it you're going up the stairs very good mrs rosenstein flash and cyborg who's you know beep bop boop i'll <laughs> give you a hand they're off to save a bunch of these prisoners and batman calls alfred alfred give me the night crawler or some night crawlers we're gonna do some fishing you know you know that you know that impractical spider looking transport vehicle that can climb up walls assuming that they can support the weight of the machine itself send that over here okay alfred all right it's coming the big tank cl starts climbing up the wall hey everybody i'm gonna get inside i'm the only one who knows how to drive this because i built it by myself so that was the cardboard one this one pretty much drives itself because it has to let's be honest they get the hostages out of this building and the flash saves some of them as some rocks almost fall down and crush them and then cyborg blasts a piece of concrete so it doesn't kill dr cyborg's dad and then batman just starts firing a machine gun at parademons from the safety of inside the nightcrawler or it's just automatically firing and he's just sort of pretending to shoot the guns wonder woman she drops her sword and dives off this ledge to go after it however wonder woman hasn't taken a basic high school class in physics or studied newton's laws of gravity and since wonder woman and the sword are falling at the same rate of speed the flash hops in and helps wonder woman get her sword back and does something arguably heroic by sort of like ding the top of the sword so that it goes back into her hand mm -hmm. but then he immediately trips and falls spectacular he's a total jackass in this movie steppenwolf starts just beating the shit out of this nightcrawler tank and bust it all up uh -huh. batman and the flash are now kind of out of commission but wonder woman is still sticking around so she takes up the fight again and uses her little bracelet smash that she evaporated that terrorist earlier with to throw steppenwolf back cyborg meanwhile has this moment with his father where he's like beep up boop i saved you i'm a hero now almost but not quite yeah and so he jumps back into the fray and then the flash everybody's punching bag he gets shot in the leg and just starts screaming like a little bitch which <laughs> honestly th this is his reaction whether he gets a splinter or a paper cut or a gaping open wound from a space laser blaster his parents paid for so many ambulance rides that were just not necessary <laughs> Yeah, that's probably why his father's in prison now. I had to rob a couple of banks to pay for all these, you know. I'm pretty sure I broke my ankle. No, that's just a sprain. It's broken. I'm going to need some x-rays. Parademons fly off with the Flash. And then Wonder Woman jumps in and saves him because the Flash sucks in this movie. Everybody regroups back in the steam tunnels. Cyborg plugs into the Nightcrawler because Cyborg is a supercomputer. And the Nightcrawler flips over and Cyborg starts firing bullets at Steppenwolf. Then rockets shoot out of the Nightcrawler and Steppenwolf just snatches one from the air and blasts a hole in the wall of the tunnel, which made me flash back to the beginning of the movie where steppenwolf was almost completely taken down by bows and arrows seems a bit inconsistent with his ability to withstand external attacks well you know logic doesn't matter scene to scene chad all right it's a Zack snyder movie yeah after he hits the wall he kind of nopes out of there with his beam of light or whatever again the flash says hey where are we again are we in a tunnel that's under anything that might be dangerous if a giant hole was blasted into the wall yes Wait, what, what's a tunnel? It's the thing that we're in. The big tube. Oh, yes. Are we in danger because of that big hole? Oh, my spleen. I got appendicitis. Someone call 911. Oh, we're not going to be able to do it from in here. We're in a tunnel. And also, we're under Gotham Harbor. It's full of water. I think those ducks are behind all of this with their tape. And then you get a... Ah! 
Hey, brother. Hey, it's me, Aquaman. Look, uh, sorry, I have let this movie get dull as shit. This whole tunnel's flooding and whatnot. I'm gonna hold it off. Check this out. I got some badass water powers. Why? Because I am badass. I'm gonna go full Moses on this. Check it out. You shall not pass. That's what they said in the Lord of the Rings, but I'm gonna say it here, man. A boom! Also, fly, you fools. That was pretty badass, too, when you gained off the gray. Uh, it fell into the, the whole chasm when that Balrog went after. Look, man, I gotta be honest. I'm a little bit of a Lord of the Rings fan. Anyway, hang on. This water is driving me back. There's a lot of water in Ocean. I am just now putting that together. Listen, I gotta be honest. I've been drinking since about 9 a.m. Had a fight with my old lady. What kind of my ex? It's a whole thing. Anyway, <laughs> you guys know that this mother box we had got stolen by this dude what looked like a bull? So he stops the water long enough for the original Fab Four to get in the Nightcrawler safely. They start climbing up the walls to get to a safe place. And then Cyborg just says, peace out. And he disappears. And we cut to the cooling tower where Steppenwolf shows up and he starts talking to the two mother boxes. He says, uh, hey guys, uh, could could you help me out and show me where that other mother box is? And then he gets zapped on the fingers and he's transported back to a scene earlier in the movie where Darkseid did battle. And in it, he drops his axe and blast into the ground and lava and rock streams out in pain and despair and i have no idea what's going on with any of this the, it reveals this symbol which i will soon learn is the anti-life equation which is what dark side is after but uh, anyway back at the battle cyborg has taken off but that is only to retrieve the mother box that he just got from the grave and he shows back up with the mother box in tow uh -huh. that's all that happens at that scene and then we go back to decide who is is you know given a jingle by uh steppenwolf and he's like so why did you call me again and steppenwolf is like uh listen uh, i really need to talk to dark side about this there's a yeah he's kind of busy right now so why don't you give me a message and i'll pass it on to him decide look i'm gonna give you a chance here uh -huh. to uh kind of cut the crap uh -huh. because look i'm sitting on something that's gonna make you feel pretty stupid when i say it okay. so why don't you just let me talk to dark side and all is forgiven. Oh, okay. Ho hold on just a moment. Oh, 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 Dark Side's here. Hold on a second. Hey, Dark Side, Steppenwolf wants to talk Finally. to you. Finally. All Can right. Can you take the phone? Here you go. Dark Side's here. Hello, it's me, uh, Dark Side. <laughs> Decide, I can see the, it's not just your voice when you call me. It's, I see you. I figured you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You're not going to talk to Darkseid. So what'd you find out? What you got? Huh? How many, how many worlds you killed? Still zero, right? You got something better than that? Yeah, I got something better than that. Look, decide one last chance. I'm sitting on a full house here. You sure? All right, look, I, I found the anti-life equation. Why don't you tell Darkseid that? Hey, Darkseid? Yeah, open up the bathroom door. I got to, hey, just crack it open. I'm talking to Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf. He knows who I am. Steppenwolf. He's just pretending. We both know that. Yeah. The idiot. No, he hadn't, he hadn't taken any plan. Anyway, he said he... What did you find? The anti-life contraption? Anti-life equation. He found an anti-life equation. Is that a big thing? It's a big thing. He said that's bullshit. That's all he said, and he closes the door. We had enchiladas <laughs> last night. He's going to be in there for a while to be honest with you are you sure you told him it was the anti-life yeah. equation this is something he's really been i told you heard me i just shouted at him he's in the big bathroom too all right well tell him to call me back when he gets a second because this is a big deal i'll tell him but he's not going to he's gonna be in there all day he can soak his feet in the tub while he takes his shit he's really tall and then <laughs> dark side actually grabs the phone from Desaad and just kind of shoves it out of the way look it's slightly deeper than steppenwolf i will come to earth once the mother boxes are united oh my god it's really you dark side i can't believe it's you and your pants are down you were taking a shit it's a big deal i'll grant you that but i'm hanging up now because i'm well, gonna go wait no this my lord my lord the, the anti-life i got it thing is here on earth and i found it me steppenwolf all by myself i got it do Look. you like me now we're for, we're good do i still you those fifty thousand what planet worlds or something you you get the anti-life Life equation. I got it. I've got it right here. I, I I know where it is. Well, that's two different things, isn't it? But yes, we're even Stevens. You you will have a place at my side. Not really. Uh, maybe I'm overselling it. You will be allowed.
allowed to hang out. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll You're take it. You're not going to have a lot of input. I'll, yes. There's no way up. You're, that's as good as it's ever going to get. I, that's fit. I'll, I'll take whatever you've got. Any position, okay? All right. Well, with that understanding, we'll talk about when I get to Earth and you've united the mother boxes. Yeah, I'm going to totally, I'm going to do all of that. I got two of them. We're working on the third. This is all coming together. You and me, buddy. We're going to rule the universe together. You right. and me. Dark right. side and Steppenwolf, all right? We're going to be like Captain and Tennille. All right. D- Desaad, do you need to say anything else to this guy? No, he's an asshole. All right. Well, look, we're going to go. All right. Have a good one. So we get to the warehouse where Batman is single-handedly building this flying monstrosity of a contraption made of cardboard, spray paint, duct tape, and pipe cleaners. <laughs> And our superheroes, they all pile out of this van because that's how they travel around, like a van hoping for their big break. Cyborg looks at this flying people mover and he says, beep bop boop, she wants to fly. I can fix this machine. I speak to intelligence. And this death trap has a software issue. And Aquaman chimes in, hey, brother, you can talk to machines? Dude, I can talk to machines. I got an Alexis in my water cave. We have got Wi-Fi under the ocean, and it is amazing, all right? Sometimes I bring a sexy little minnow over for a little R&R after a night out, and I'll shout something like, Alexis, who's got two thumbs and is the baddest mf in all the seven seas? And she'll say, it's you, Aqua, bro. And then I pump my fist at my big old chest like this and just get her all worked up. You know how I do? And then I put on Hotel California, dim the lights, see where the night takes us. Spoilers, it's the juncture of Pantytown and Aqua Crotch. High five! Uh, while we're on the subject of you being a weirdo, because we were, if you missed that, why do you have this mother box? Or maybe you're working for Steppenwolf. I mean, I don't know you from nothing, man. I mean, I'm not saying you ain't cool as hell, but and I've known some dastardly types in my life. I grew up with a great white shark named Nathan, ate three little kids. Now, that's not cool, but he's a good storyteller, man. You get a couple of drinks in him, he had something to say. Not only were the stories funny, but you kind of learned something, too. He's badass, man. Let me ask you a question, Cyborg. You got an Alexis at home or hell inside you? Sometimes my Alexis, I'll be like, Alexis, where's a good place to go get tacos? She don't say nothing. And you know why it is? I unplugged it when I was making margaritas night before. I got I pulled it out for the blender. Forgot to plug it back in. I do that shit all the time. Can I log into like your foot or something? Hey, Alexis, log into my account. All right, play Hotel California. And look, that's going to solve a lot of problems between us. Wonder Woman chimes in. Even if we could find the other two mother boxes, Steppenwolf is the strongest being I've ever seen on Earth, except for another. But we'll discuss him in Act 3 of our movie. And I'm not exactly sure how this movie is structurally pieced together. The Flash, who still sucks, says, Oh, I think you might be talking about Superman. He's the greatest superhero ever. No offense, but he's amazing. He could do everything all of us could do, only better. Look, do you have a flamethrower inside you, cyborg? You think maybe you could use that to destroy the mother box? beep ba boop First of all, no, you can't log into my foot. These mother boxes are just giant change machines. You saw the chapter title? That's what this is. It can destroy worlds. It can make worlds. It can do whatever the hell it wants because it's a magical MacGuffin. Beep boop Hey, man, I love that idea, all right? I like when things get hot, they get crazy. I like heat, too. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Have you ever used KY warming gel with the ladies? It's not an all-the-time kind of thing. Special occasions only. Put a little berry white on, slather things up with some KY fire and ice, some little ocean maiden. You got a night to remember that puts a Titanic to shape. Let me tell you a little uh, how-to from your friend Aquaman, all right? When you were buying lube and you plan to do it with a fish, do not get the water-soluble lube. That is just a pro tip. Batman says, hey, Cyborg, where did you get this mother box? Wasn't from a bunch of ducks, was it? And Aquaman says, bro, I was just going to ask that. You ask the best questions. You should be a detective. Also, computer bro, are you working with these aliens? I got to know right here, right now. Because if you are, that is not cool, brother. And Cyborg starts to tell the story of how the mother box went from being buried at Miller's Crossing and ending up here on this table at Wayne Enterprises. And Cyborg says, beep, pop, boop. It's a long story. At first, the Nazis got it. Then Indiana Jones showed up and he stopped them. And then the Allies got it from Indiana Jones. And then it was in the Pentagon for 70 years. And then when the Pentagon egghead started studying Superman ship, they dug this out because they thought it was alien technology. The head egghead at the Pentagon woke up the mother box. Did I mention that in a car accident, I was almost killed, chopped up my body. That happened too. Long story short, my dad has the head egghead and the mother box is what gave me this robot body. 
So you are working with aliens, that's what you're saying? Because if so, man, it is not cool. Beep pop boop. The mother boxes just change matter. They can reinstate particle relationship. If a house burns down, a mother box can take the smoke and turn it back into a house. Oh, look, we're all thinking the same thing. Who's going to say it first? I'm not going to be the first one to say it. Hey, bro, I'll say it, all right? Can this mother box turn a turd back into Nacho's Bel Grande? Because if so, we just solve world hunger. The so is like, beep, up, up, no, you idiots. And then projects an image of Superman uh -huh. on top of the mother box. This is where we're going to move in, the, in this movie is, hey, we got to go bring Superman back to life. Yeah. Speaking of Superman, Ma Kent shows up at Lois Lane's house and these two decide to just, you know, sit around and be sad together. The whole thing looks like a Folgers coffee commercial. Their mugs are all steaming and there's all these dark shadows consuming this two generations of women who are backlit as they talk about grandma's cinnamon roll recipe. Yeah, they're just crying together. It's like both of them are like, my life has been shit. My life's been more shit. Oh yeah. Well, I hear you haven't been back to work. No, I haven't. I hear you got kicked the fuck out of your house that happened too we're just about the most miserable people you're ever gonna run into <laughs> Ma Kent wraps this up and says, you know, I went by the Daily Planet and Mr. Perry White, he's black in these movies, by the way. He said, you haven't been to work since Clark Kent died. That was like a year ago or maybe a week. I don't really know how time passes in this movie. Also, how are you paying your bills? And Lois Lane says, mm, I can't. That's her answer, Bo. I can't. Yeah. I'll be rooming with you soon enough, Ma Kent. Is there room in that U-Haul trailer for two of us? Or we're just going to nomad land our way north. I will <laughs> say that these two actresses of Amy Adams and, and Diane Lane, they do a good job in this scene. It's all sad. It's perfect for a Zack Snyder movie. And it ends with Ma Kent telling Lois Lane, come back to the living Lois Lane. It's kind of this folksy version of snap out of it and get your shit together, which it's a nice little scene. Until, Bo, Ma Kent leaves the apartment, steps out in the hallway, her eyes glow red like the devil and she turns into this cloaked sad looking alien that is according to the internet martian manhunter or according to him in about an hour so he's a martian meaning that he's from mars the martian manhunter is a real also ran of a dc hero for me i just don't know that much about him is his first name marvin no like his name is it's not john johnson but it's something like that are you sure it's not marvin i'm pretty sure mm. he is not in fact marvin the martian mm, i do think man is the most interesting insect of earth <laughs> <laughs> the illudium p32 space modulator <laughs> Marvin the Martian Manhunter immediately morphs into a military general or some yeah. higher up in the armed services. That doesn't mean anything in this movie. The whole scene is a waste of time because it doesn't progress in either character really anyway. So we cut back to our Justice League. Uh, at the warehouse. D they're debating how to bring Superman back. Wonder Woman is like, look, I'm just going to say this once. If we use this box for anything... Steppenwolf will know where it is and will immediately come for it. No way, bro. Dead is dead, all right? You don't mess around with this kind of voodoo shit. My old lady, Lisa Bonet, she made a movie called Angel Heart. That is a freaky movie, all right? You start dealing with voodoo and the devil and eating people, I'm out of here, bro. Adios amigos. You know, there's that whole movie about it called Pet Cemetery, about burying some son of a bitch up in an Indian graveyard. I know that ain't PC anymore. I don't think you can write that book today, but... <laughs> The point stands. Sometimes dead is better. Herman Munster said that, and I believe that guy. Oh, honestly, what what choice do we have? Superman is awesome, all right? He's the greatest thing ever. We've got to get him back in this movie. And on top of that, we're two hours and 21 minutes into this film, and we've only got an hour and 40 left to get our marquee superhero back. He's not even here yet. By the way, he's my favorite. Wait, wait, wait. I, I have a detective idea. So, the box will call to Steppenwolf. But it didn't call out to him before until Superman was dead. I think Superman, because of all his superpowers and not being just rich, I think that means that if we bring him back to life, then he can beat up Steppenwolf. Yeah, really, this is all Superman's fault for getting killed in the last movie to make all this happen. It's not my fault for trying to kill him i'd already stopped trying to kill him i i after i found out about the whole martha martha i i guess i should tell you guys i'm bruce wayne i don't know if i told everyone anyway it doesn't matter my mother was named martha too she got shot in an alley it was pearls bounced 
it was really sad and his mother is alive named martha and uh yeah that's why we're you know we were at odds but then we found that and but by the time he died we were cool i can promise everyone we were totally cool long story short i vote to bring back zombie superman who's with me Shit, bro. You say it that way, I'm down with bringing back a zombie Superman. Give me 20 minutes to take a shit and I'll be ready to roll. <laughs> Fade to Black, Part 5, All the King's Horses, which is an ominous title because if my study of all things Dumpty serves me well, isn't the line All the King's Horses in partnership with all the King's men who fail to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Yeah, but in fairness, you don't really want horses doing that kind of delicate work. No, that's true fade in on the flash and cyborg grave robbing superman's corpse from earth oh i guess i can uh, uh check this off my bucket list yeah <laughs> that's a little bit of humor exhuming superman from the grave am i right cyborg you know superman was my hero Beep, boop, boop. <sighs> cyborg is just like when he says you know we could do this super fast and cyborg's like beep boop, boop. We could, but that seems disrespectful somehow, or maybe we just don't have the budget for that. Not really sure, but uh, yeah, well, we got to dig up this body. Why don't they just dig him up super fast? I don't know. Just savor the moment of digging up a corpse. When's that ever going to come around again? Right, and how like disrespectful is it to dig up a superhero's grave with superpowers? Like, is that any more or less offensive? Aren't you already... like As soon as you decided that you're going to pilfer a grave, how you do it is inconsequential to me. You have you, That's the, the act. Yeah, I agree. Nearby, there's a van large enough to transport a casket with Superman's lifeless shell of a body inside and aquaman and wonder woman they're just hanging out catching up and wonder woman says how long has it been since your people and my people have spoken uh i don't know uh when did we start i'm half atlantean all right the other half is uncut prime aged badass all right by the way i hate atlanteans as much as you amazonians do i got complicated issues with my folks back home long story short they're dicks i'm awesome by the way on my way out i'm gonna take these shots i ordered four they are for me Aquaman, Aquaman. Hate is useless. Hate leads to fear. Fear leads to suffering. Yoda taught me that in The Empire Strikes Back. Hey, our group needs a Yoda. Or like a splinter. You know that mouse that hangs out with the Ninja Turtles? Like a walking fortune cookie? Look, I'm into spiritualism and self-realization, Katan. And look, that's kind of my thing. All right, my dad, he was the coolest hombre you ever met. And one time, here's what he told me. None are taken from the darkness... Not without giving one in return. Holy shit! Did you know my dad? All right, that is Aquaman Sr. original material. My papa was a Rolling Stone. Maybe he shared his wisdom far and wide. All right, if he was alive, I'd nominate my dad to be our Yoda. Damn, I just, I miss my dad so much. When I think about him, I miss your dad. You know, my dad definitely couldn't be a, a, a splinter because he doesn't know any martial arts or nothing. Maybe an orco. My, my dad be a good orco, I think. I don't think that little son of a bitch did nothing. No, my dad got high like orco floating around stuff. Oh, I miss him so much. Just thinking about him. I'll tell you what, Wonder Woman, I'm just going to go over here, have a couple drinks, listen to some Alma Brothers, calm down a little bit. Flash and Cyborg, they're slowly digging around the ground. The Flash looks up and says, oh, you know, that Wonder Woman, she's one hot piece of ass. You think she'd ever go for, you know, a younger guy like me? And Cyborg was like, beep bop boop. She's 5,000 years old. The Flash, every guy's younger than her. And that is the apex of humor in this movie. It does not get any better than that. Yeah, that's probably the funniest joke, and that is not going to crack a smile for most no. people. Batman and Alfred, meanwhile, are back working on his plane, and it's still broken because Batman's building it. Mm-hmm. Alfred, get me more elbow macaroni and more Elmer's glue. Also, perhaps some glitter. I think that's really what's going to get this thing going. Master Wade, you fulfilled your promise and pulled together this group of superheroes to fight this war. But this plan of bringing Superman back from the dead, you know, that children's book that I read to you every night to put you to sleep, the part about Humpty Dumpty and all the king's horses and all the king's men, that's not that just... That part makes me sad. I know you always cry, but I tried to impress upon you. It is not not a story just about a broken egg man this is quite similar to your friends and well superman wait a second what about superman you know alfred i'm operating on faith not reason did that sound smart i've been thinking about that one for a while i thought it would sound smart look we're gonna do this all right 
And not you, or Humpty Dumpty, or those sewer ducks, or anyone who's gonna stop me and my new friends who are super from using this outer space box to bring back my dead, my, my dead friend. There! I said it. Superman's my friend. All right? Whew. Such a sense of relief. Getting those words out of my mouth into the universe. Boy, I miss them so much. Miss my mom and my dad, too. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really at odds, Alfred. I mean, on the one hand, I'm known as a detective. I, I, one who uses logic and reason. I know you are, Master. But I'm, I think I'm just going to throw away that defining characteristic, Alfred. I, I, I think I'm just going to abandon my one of, one of the core tenets of, of what makes me Batman. I'm, I'm sure that you certainly are. Uh, Master Wayne, why don't you have a seat here? I've got you a cup of cocoa, and I'll just read you this book. Humpty Dumpty. Oh, is this the one about the eggs? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Yes. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Oh, this is my favorite part. This is where it gets exciting, Alfred. So the grave robbing is complete, and our crew packs up and leaves to go somewhere. All those hostages that were held by Steppenwolf earlier, they are now in quarantine, and a worker walks over to Dr. Cyborg's dad and says, uh, Hey, pal, everybody's clean. We uh, swept the facility. There's no space herpes, uh, alien germs floating around. You're free to go, all right? Uh, check out with the receptionist up front. Get yourself a prize from the treasure chest in the lobby when you leave, all right? And then our band of superheroes, they're getting ready to enter this top secret research facility to resurrect Superman's body. Beyond their comments earlier to use the mother box to bring it back to life, are we aware like as to why they're breaking into this top secret facility? It has to do with Superman's spaceship that flew to Earth or something? Yeah, I don't think they explicitly ever say in this movie what the plan is other than mother box and dead Superman. That's it, right? They say that they have to supercharge the mother box for it to take effect, but that's kind of it. It still doesn't explain, like, why do we have to do it in this ship? I don't think anyone ever says that. It needs that Doc Brown moment. When this thing hit 88 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry it's not to scale and I didn't have time to paint it. I know, Doc. It's great. But but here's how the movie's going to end. All right, fine. Yes. It, like I just feel like somebody should say, for me, the dummy in the audience, like, even if it's the flesh i don't understand any of this someone explain it to me i've got a tiny pea brain but i can run super fast so how are we gonna bring superman back to life again we gotta put him in the sewage the problem is that there's nobody smart in this group to explain it or come up with the idea <laughs> you're right like all right here's my plan everyone mother box and superman all right on three go one two superman's great Oh, shit. We're just going to cheer him in, back into life. I've got to do some funny things and fall down because I can. The Flash drives a military truck into Star Labs, and he's at this security checkpoint, and Cyborg uses his computer powers to override the system to get the Flash past the guards. Although the Flash does everything in his being to look like a guilty moron who clearly is not approved military personnel. Right, yeah. And when you take inventory of the superpowers of all of the individuals involved in this Ocean 5 caper, only two and a half of them really have superpowers in this environment. Batman's just a dude in a costume. Aquaman is on terra firma. And unless there's, you know, an aquarium inside, he's of no use. The Flash is always operating at half capacity because he's a dumbass. It's really just Wonder Woman and Cyborg who have any real focus, mental capabilities, or what you would call superhuman power. You're 100% right. Most of these people, I mean, it, it's it's a bad team of superheroes because, again, most of them are unrelatable, and the one character that's not unrelatable is off-putting. And that's just not the combination you want for your, your team of adventurers, you know? Dr. Cyborg's dad shows up to see how progress is going at the top secret research facility as he's been working on something. I don't know what it is. It involves lasers, but it doesn't really matter. Cyborg sets off a biohazard alarm in the facility and then everyone evacuates. Our five superheroes walk in with the mother box in hand. Dr. Cyborg's dad sees his son marching in with his new pals and Dr. Cyborg's dad rescinds his view initially of saying like this is a false alarm and instead says, hey everybody get the hell out of here. You're all gonna die. Don't come back in unless I say so. I got your son and they don't have a father-son moment here either it, it's crazy that this isn't a moment where they just kind of like you're with them now son you know something like that of like you found your no, place or something that. something uh, anything would be better than the nothing that happens the five superheroes make their way down into the catacombs of this building where they find superman spaceship and to stop the pacing of this moment the movie cuts away to lois lane who was awake at night lying in bed overcome with crippling depression it looks like a cymbalta commercial she opens up her 
bedside table and pulls out her Daily Planet ID. And we also see that there is a box of pregnancy tests in there. Was she trying to get pregnant with Superman's baby? I guess. I. That's what killed that Brian Singer reboot real quick. That and all the alleged sexual assault of underage boys. Maybe more the latter than the former. The team opens up this coffin uh-huh. where they find Superman and the picture of his dad, Kevin Costner, to like tuck, ah! tucked into his hand. I just, I miss my dad so much. I miss him so much. Pa Kent. I know I'm not alive yet, but I just miss him so much. <laughs> Aquaman picks up the corpse and carries it down into this pool of thigh deep round swamp sludge. Brother, this is gross. I am not going to lie. This, it feels like, you know, when I was talking about that lube earlier, like if it was just a little bit thinner. And also, it smells. It, smell, it smells like uh, one time this raccoon got caught at the beach and uh, it, it got super fat because it was dead and under the sun for like, you know, eight hours, just baking on the beach. And then that night some bird pecked at its belly and it popped like a balloon man and it was wretched that smelled better than this stuff i'm just gonna plop superman in this water and we're gonna see what happens here we cut away to lois lane she's now buying cups of coffee in the early a.m because Bo, lois lane is back baby she's back yeah cut back to our superheroes and cyborg says beep bop boop the mother box isn't working and the flash says oh hey i can wake it up by running super fast and creating an electrical current you were going to what? When did that become part of the plan? Uh, right. Yeah, th- 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 we're improvising a lot at this point. Wonder Woman looks incredibly skeptical because she's the smartest one of these five clowns. Cut back over to Lois Lane as she's walking up to the Superman shrine and she sees that one cop from earlier and she's like, oh, sigh. I'm back for just one last visit. He's like, oh, thanks a lot, Miss Lane. I like the cup of coffee. Cut back to our hapless heroes with the spaceship and the raccoon swamp water. And over the loudspeaker, GLaDOS shows up to say, this is a bad idea. Waking up the mother box will alert Steppenwolf. He will come for it. And let's be honest, only three of you have any superpowers here and now. And one of those people is the Flash, who is incompetent in every conceivable way. Wait a second. That computer makes a lot of good points. Maybe we ought to pull back on the stick on this one. Yo, am I the only one here having a sense of deja vu? Haven't we been here and done this before? Look, I'm agree with that loudspeaker robot lady. This seems like a real bad idea right now. I am almost 110% sure this is going to result in us duking it out with Superman, and that ain't a good idea, brother. Seriously, nobody else here has got a sense that we've done this? Christ, I got some of this water in my mouth. I'm going to vomit. I'm pretty sure I got raccoon cancer. Batman chimes in. Hey, shut up. You, you, you've got to do this. It's the only way I'm going to overcome the grief of killing my best friend. That's right. I said it. Superman's my best friend. Maybe I'm not his best friend, but he's he's my best friend. And I miss him so, so, ma, so much. Just bring him back to life. Look, I don't, uh, <laughs> we'd have to double check with Water Woman over there, but I thought you guys knew each other for like 20 minutes. You can live a lifetime in 20 minutes, Aquaman. You absolutely cannot. 20 minutes is like, hey, that I got to get to the McDonald's and get me an Egg McMuffin before 11 a.m. They stop selling them. And that 20 <laughs> minutes is to get to the McDonald's, not back. So that's why <laughs> if it is 1045 a.m., this guy does not drive to McDonald's for an Egg McMuffin. So before they drop the mother box in the water to jumper cable superman back to life cyborg has multiple visions of doom in the future there's an explosion and the earth is consumed with ash and lava from north to south pole dark side shows up he's on his throne looking quite pleased with himself there is a funeral pyre and wonder woman is burning on it while her mom looks on she's all sad like a uh, lois lane and we cut to the bottom of the ocean where dark side stabs aquaman with his own trite and he's like hey it's not cool bro and then the movie shows a superman for the very first time in this movie kneeling on the ground holding a charred skeleton weeping as dark side places his hands on superman's shoulders then we see what appears to be superman floating mid-air with batman's decapitated head in his hand yeah Bo, that is how this movie reintroduces superman into the film as part of an apocalyptic vision of the future where superman is kneeling in defeat or flying around with batman's head in his hand yeah i mean welcome to zack snyder's 
Avengers, the Justice League. <laughs> you are describing the reason I hate this movie. You notice they didn't show you how the Flash died in the future because the cheering from the audience would have been disrupted <laughs> to the viewing experience. You know, and, and it'll tie together to the scene at the end. Like, both of these Flash Forward scenes that we get are terrible, but this is the better of the two. At this point, Cyborg whispers, beep bop boop no. But down the hallway, the Flash hears him and he says, what? What was that? Did you say go? I'm going to assume you said go. Okay. And a one and a two and a zippity do. And then <laughs> off the flash runs, the mother boxes drop down into the raccoon swamp water. The flash fires off a spark of electricity when the mother box touches the water. But apparently it's important that all of this needs to happen at the exact same moment. And the initial attempt is kind of failed. And it also has no sense of suspense whatsoever. And since his timing is off a little bit, the flash is able to reverse time because remember he can do that and that's important later in the movie especially in the finale which is not very good and at this moment the flash goes back in time just a little bit so he touches the mother box at the right moment sparks fly an explosion happens the mother box boom goes through the roof crash lands on a car nearby dr cyborg's dad who's outside keeping people in check he takes off his blazer to kick into scientific high gear he looks like a politician getting ready to do nothing and then up in the sky Bo, superman flies and he's back floating over the city and fortunately lois lane is down on the street and she sees this and is just transfixed with his return right so superman flies down to the memorial that's convenient yeah which is nearby thankfully he's wearing black pants and no jacket and no shirt or tie and no shoes this explosion blew off his clothes a la the incredible Hulk. yeah my body my choice man it would have been better if he had been completely naked with his big old super cock just flopping around yeah like dr manhattan from watchmen it's not like Zack snyder hadn't done it before <laughs> that's right show show me the super dick <laughs> You know, a hashtag release the super dick cut that's what i want to see now now we got something now we got henry cavill's dick preserved for all time you think they'd have to go in and like cgi out all of his pubes right yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can still see it though it's moving around it's weird it was wiggly it's around, yeah but, but yeah at this point, four of our five superheroes, they land into frame and you see their feet go ka-thunk, 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 ka-thunk. It kind of looks like they all flew there, but Aquaman can't fly. So did he just like jump into frame or maybe Wonder Woman or Cyborg flew in the air with him like a baby? Uh, the chick was the one that took me and hey, there are worse ways to travel. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, hey, I, I didn't have any room for extra baggage. If you catch my drift, and I think you do. Superman turns around and sees all four of them. And Wonder Woman says, he's back. And the Flash is all giddy to see his hero in person. And then Superman scans their bodies and he sees their flesh and bones inside of them. And Cyborg narrates the movie, beep bop boop, something's wrong. He's scanning us. Oh shit, my auto defense system is in danger. Double shit, my arm is turning into a cannon. Triple shit, here we go. Buckle up, I'm about to shoot a rocket at Superman. And then that happens and Superman's not happy. And Superman's Superman fires his laser vision at Cyborg, blast him back while also exploding a car. And with Cyborg temporarily down, Wonder Woman picks up narrator duties and says, he is confused. He does not know who he is. And then Wonder Woman and Aquaman, they try to stop Superman. That doesn't work. And then Cyborg gets back into action and tries to help out. That doesn't work. And then here, Bo, finally, the Flash kicks into high gear and decides to take control of things. Right. But as he's running at him, we see Superman kind of eyeball and I'm like, hey, wait a second. What's this fat son of a bitch doing? And so Superman throws everyone else away and starts taking swings at the Flash. Oh, jeez. And he kind of ducks away until Superman just kind of throws him too. Oh, my back. Oh, 911. Call three ambulances. Then Superman gets attacked by the U.S. Army, apparently. Uh-huh. They've shown up all of a sudden. And again, because he's a superhero, Chad, he just eye lasers these Humvees that these Army dudes showed up with in half. Yep. And then Cyborg, at least, shows up to save like this old cop from getting smooshed by some building or something that's fallen. Then most viewers are thinking, hey, isn't Batman in this movie? And so Batman shows up and is like, hey. Superman, are you okay? Because, uh, you know, we're cool, right? Like, you remember me? Your old pal Batman? Son of Martha? My mom's name's Martha. Your mom's Martha. We're the Martha boys. Martha, Martha. <laughs> hey, and also, I just brought you back to life. Isn't that, that's mind-blowing. 
I mean, look, I don't, I don't usually mess with necromancy. That's, that's a big no-no around here. But it worked. I'm just saying it worked. It was all my idea. Unless you hate it. Then it was the Flash's idea. And then Cyborg comes at him, and Superman just pile drives Cyborg. He blasts Batman with laser vision, and then it kicks him into a cop car, which would kill Batman. Yeah. But he's not dead, because that would be sad. And then finally, to calm him down, Lois shows up, Lois Lane, and, and Superman is like, wait a second, I recognize her. I think I had sex with her. Hey, Clark, it's, it's me, Lois. Lois Lane. We were in love. We were trying to make a baby. And then he just grabs her and flies off. Uh, and everybody's okay with that. I'll tell you what, brother. That was something. We just got our asses handed to us by an evil Superman. Now, I thought Steppenwolf was going to be a problem, but both of them? Oh, my goodness. We might want to pack it up. Hey, did I tell you guys I got a sweet pad under the ocean? Let them find us there, brother. Hey, speaking of Steppenwolf, what's that up in the sky? One of the blue tubes? Oh, shit. And then a blue tube comes down. Steppenwolf's there. Wonder Woman looks over at Cyborg and she's like hey do you know where the mother box is and he's like beep poop i thought you had it oh shit and then <laughs> steppenwolf crashes into star labs and dr cyborg's dad he's in there with the mother box and he takes a laser and blasts it at it to you think he's gonna blow it up but it doesn't blow up and during this process cyborg shows up steppenwolf's there and then the laser heating process disintegrates dr cyborg's dad in front of his son and he is gone from our movie thus giving cyborg Cyborg, more daddy issues than he had earlier in the movie. Right. And Steppenwolf takes advantage of this moment where he's like, well, a lot of, a lot of other issues around here. I'm really more of a work kind of problem I've got going on right now. Listen, I, I could go on all day about it. I got a whole middle man. It, it just drives me crazy. It's this guy decide. I won't. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but one, I got to get the mother box. And so he just yeah. drives an axe into Cyborg and gets him out of the way, grabs the mother box, and he says, so begins the end and then he's gone aquaman shows up with i think wonder woman he's like i don't want to be and i told you so but i had a bad feeling about waking up that mother box since the beginning do you all see how pissed off superman was hell that's the first time i ever met the guy he went full rodeo on my ass i'm not even sure that that's superman he's more like super jerk <laughs> you ask me i gotta tell you i will i fool me once shame on me fool me twice won't get fooled again i'm just saying man i thought that we was just kind of you know testing each other out a little bit just kind of a little play shoving like you in a parking lot sometimes you just want to do a little shoving show the girls that you mean it that's all brother that's all i wanted to do maybe buy the guy a drink after you know i think he might have broke my rib man i'm a superhero my ribs don't get broke but that's a strong dude batman late to the party as usual he comes staggering in he's like run 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my guys. Hey, dare you ever see Superman? Oh, yeah. he recognized Lois Lane. She's his girlfriend. None of you know that because you weren't in the last movie. Well, Wonder Woman, you might remember that because uh, you were in the movie, but I don't know if, if I ever introduced the two of you. If not, that's my bad. And then Cyborg, he comes in and he says, beep pop boop my Dr. Cyborg dad wasn't trying to destroy the mother box. He was heating it up so we could find it. And Batman says, hey, I've got some satellites that can find hot things on Earth. Let's go back to my clubhouse and I'll bet we can find it from there. Fade out, part six, something darker. And this, Chad, is my first legitimate laugh of the movie. It's like the Spinal Tap thing of how much more black could this movie get? And the answer is none. None more black. Is someone going to get cancer? <laughs> right, like, the, the movie ends with just Batman in a hospital bed in the ICU <laughs> as nurses gather around to try to save him, but they can't, Chad. They can't. Shirtless Superman and Lois Lane. They fly out to the Kent farm from Metropolis like where is metropolis in relationship to the kent farm is it just on the outskirts because they seem to get there pretty quick yeah i mean it's one thing for superman to not suffer wind shear but poor lois lane shows up her face just scarred red you know oh clark uh I'm, I'm missing 30% of my hair now. They land on the farm and Lois Lane says, You brought us here. You remembered your home, Clark. That's your real name, Clark. Clark Kent. And I'm your true love. That's important that you remember that. I'm the only woman on Earth that you love. Lois and Superman go in the house and she gives him a red flannel shirt to cover up his gorgeous sculptured torso. Superman comes around and he surveys the land of the Kent farm. Cut to the Bat Cave, I think. And Batman shows up with all of his buddies and the flower Flash acts like a total hump and just gushes over everything. They hop on a computer and they find a hotspot of the mother box and it's out in that ghost city near Moscow. And
and Cyborg says, beep bop boop, we need to get inside. I think if I link up with the Unity and fuse with it, everything will be okay. And Wonder Woman says, no, the Unity will get inside you and find your weakness. It will destroy you. And Cyborg says, beep bop boop, if I die, we all die. If it gets inside me, I can save the day. And I gotta do it for my, for my, for my Dr. Cyborg dad. I miss him so much. Look, man, you got a lot going on with your dad, and I got to warn you, you doing this, it's like fighting the devil in hell itself. That's pretty awesome. Hey, look, guys, this guy Steppenwolf, he's probably killed all kinds of people on all kinds of planets, and he's probably going to kill us too. Look, I'm too scared and frail to die. I don't want to get killed by Steppenwolf. He's never faced us. Not united. This League of Justicity. I'm still working on that name. I'll tell you, man, I like about, I don't know, 60% 60% of that a lot of it's good at like league of it, it, that's pretty cool but yeah justicity I don't even think that's a real word man I make up shit all the time like I, I one time I, I threw my remote control at my TV because uh, I, I saw somebody was ripping off uh, Aqua Velva on uh, the QVC and uh, I said I'll, I'll floop it and floop it ain't no word man that's just something i said because i was real angry at the time because they was ripping me off man take money out of my pocket brother anyway <laughs> i'm just saying justicity I, I i think that's a i think that's your floop it back at the kid farm superman is wandering around in hip high corn as the sun sets this is the kind of shot that gives michael bay heart palpitation <laughs> in lois lane she walks out and superman sees her and he says ah lois i'll take that as a yes the ring on your finger are they getting married? Because they appear to do everything backwards, <laughs> which explains why she had a pregnancy test after he died. Right? <laughs> She's got Benjamin Button in that womb. <laughs> some some creepy old man baby's going to come out of It's got cataracts, man. We don't know how. I'd say this baby was 98 years old. <laughs> Superman says, I have a second chance, Lo. I don't want to waste it. He calls her Lo and not Lois. He's a Cracker fan. Lo is short for Lois. And so then Martha shows up. Ma Kent. Honk, honk. Hey, I was just driving by. I don't really have any place to live. Thought I'd come back to the farm. Oh, it's my boy. Clark Kent, I can't believe you're back. I heard on the radio she was flying around, but I couldn't believe it. You're inside for sore eyes. (laughs) And they hug. And then he says, listen, uh, I've got to blow you two ladies off. I need to go find out why the team wanted me back. So I guess, uh, can you give Lois a ride? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sure she can get in the back of the u-haul got the dog in the front seat he's got a case of the mange you don't want to sit up there he's also been leaking from his anus you don't want to be in the front seat but anyway sure hop in the back lois you'll be just fine here's a box of kleenex i know how you like to cry all the time um clark and then he's gone <laughs> back at the <laughs> league of justicity aquaman is like look y'all i'm worried about cyborg look this ain't fair to the poor kid he just lost his dad that's got to be all up in his head he ain't playing at 100%. <laughs> and now we're asking him to interface with this uh, mother box, whatever the hell that is. He's got our daddy issues already. Won't we'll throw some mommy issues on top. I don't like none of that. I think what we ought to do is just take a couple 22s. Let's let's pop a couple of shots at it. Let's just see what happens, man. For what it's worth, just to put it on the record, I lost my mom when I was a kid. And it messed me up bad. What? You lost your mom when you was a kid? My mom died when I was a kid. My dad's in prison for killing my mom. But he's innocent. That messed me up too. And you know what else? Bad Batman's mom and dad, they got murdered in front of him. And I heard earlier that Wonder Woman's boyfriend, he was killed in World War I, but he came back in the 80s, and the two of them had sex. He was a ghost, and he was inside a stranger's body. I bet that really screwed her up as well. Man, I gotta tell you, I am not the biggest fan of you and what you were saying. Like, about five seconds into that, I started thinking about my favorite happy hours. I got up to, uh, over at the O Charlie's, they got mudslides for like... <laughs> Two bucks. I mean, two bucks, man. Who's going to say no to a mudslide for that? They're delicious, and they will jack you up, man. It's like a milkshake that also punches you right in the tank. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, brother. I'm going to just let you stay here and not be near me. I'm going to head over there, put on some Zep, smoke a J, and just think about O'Charlie's. So, Batman, meanwhile, tells Wonder Woman, he's like, Look, I had this crazy dream that the... The Flash showed up, and he said, Lois Lane is the key. And then I woke up, and I think my pants were wet, but it was sticky wet. And then the executives from Warner Brothers came in and said, you have to cut that storyline out of the movie. That's why I've never talked about this with anyone before. So, are we a thing after the mouse? 
I feel weird telling you all this now. I No, we are not a thing after the mouse, unless my dead boyfriend's ghost gets inside your body, which is probably not going to happen. Master Wayne, Master Wayne, you must come and see this. Oh, wait. And so everybody runs over, and they go up on the roof, and all the superheroes are outside, and Batman's flying cardboard contraption shows up, and Cyborg is there, and he says, beep, pop, boop, I fixed your flying machine. So everybody get on board, and off we'll fly together. So they go to the nuclear water tower in Russia, that had to be a long flight, Bo. Yeah. So Steppenwolf, we, we cut over to him and he's like, redemption is nigh. And starts fusing the mother boxes together and they start coming together into one thing. And uh-huh. then we cut to the Amazon island, Themyscira, where they're looking all nervous. And then we see the Atlanteans and they look all nervous too. And even Alfred is pouring a drink back at the Batcave. You know, a little nip of coach. Yeah, so he's poured a drink, and even he stopped short. So we cut back to our jet where Batman and the rest of the the League of Justicity is flying there to take down these shields. Batman's going to do that. Flash is then going to run super, super fast to generate enough power to supercharge Cyborg as he interfaces with the mother boxes while Wonder Woman and Aquaman basically run interference. And this is the plan, which at least the movie stops to be like, hey, here's what's about to happen. Although none of it is grounded in any real measurable level of connected behavior or suspense. Well, no. It's just here's what we're gonna go do and i guess that's gonna do something right so we cut away from that because we don't want to build momentum and we get a look at superman who's back on his kryptonian ship and there are these competing voiceovers it's jor-el and pa kid they're both saying to him you can be the light of the people of the world and then one by one we get these reveals of different superman costumes and then superman picks out the black costume and we hear both of his dad say things like i'm so proud of you son your mother and i loved you your mother and i knew you would change the world you gave hope to the world p.s your mom and i love you and then this whole scene ends with the two dads each saying fly son fly and superman blasts off into the sky to absorb energy from the sun and this entire scene begs for the john williams score to be played why is it not included here for 10 seconds why the black suit why that it's just it looks awful i again it this is a real like hashtag not my superman moment of like i just don't want to see superman grinning as he wears black that's just not what i want superman to be cut to our superheroes getting armed to do battle with some sweet metal guitar licks in the background they're all arming up getting their game faces on and then we cut over to the flash and he's doing tai chi i loathe the flash in this movie they unload from the flying cardboard transport box and batman and says knock down the tower take out that shield that's why i brought you together this ragtag group of super powered misfits i'm like danny ocean or kermit the frog now go make me proud now no matter what you see you stick to the plan i'm gonna take care of that shield no matter how much i beg <laughs> or plead stick to the plan everybody jumps out batman is flying his transport air vehicle and it immediately crashes because he doesn't know how to fly it (laughs) he goes down and gets into a batmobile that's nested inside this flying machine drives it out the parademons go after him they're shooting at him and there's a lot of slow motion and bullets are flying and buildings crashing and eventually the batmobile suffers critical damage because i don't think batman knows how to drive it and just when the parademons pop open the top like a tuna can wonder woman thankfully shows up to save batman for getting killed because he doesn't have superpowers yeah uh, there is in this moment aquaman being lifted into the air by the parademons Uh uh-huh this is maybe the the moment that comes closest to a movie i want to see where aquaman murders one of the parademons with a trident just like oh stick it three times brother that's what a trident's good for and then just rides this dead carcass down to earth like a surfboard on the air yeah it's pretty good there's the of course the my man uh, to the uh, cyborg who throws him into the air. But then, yeah, the Batmobile gets all blown up. Batman jettisons out. There's more shooting, more lasers, more teamwork, more parademons, more slow motion. Right. Flash is running super fast. He starts He starts running around the town. Is any of this any good? I couldn't tell. I might have COVID-19 because I've lost my ability to detect quality and 
most movies these days. It's no. I, I don't think any of the action scenes are very good. Back at wherever Alfred is, Superman shows up and he lands and uh, Alfred's like, oh dear. And Superman says, uh, excuse me, old man. Is this where Batman lives? Is, is he here? Uh, do you know where I can find him? And he's like, oh, he's in Moscow. Superman says, thank you. Well, goodbye. Yeah. yeah. We go back to where the action's happening. Cyborg and Aquaman, they find Steppenwolf, who has taken in some mojo from the combined mother boxes into the Unity. So he's super powered up. And then Wonder Woman shows up. So it's three against one, more fighting, more slow motion. Outside the Flash, he's still running around really fast. Inside, Cyborg is in position to touch the Unity. And he calls out to the Flash, needing his electrical charge. But before the Flash can send over the charge, Cyborg gets got by Steppenwolf. So there's more fighting more punching more cyborg more wonder woman aquaman there's no sign of batman at all steppenwolf stops fighting long enough to tell wonder woman oh by the way i killed everybody on your home island whoopsie <laughs> hope that doesn't make you angry and inspire you to fight harder which did he do that or is that a bluff i don't remember him doing it but again they, you know a lot of this movie don't make no sense so maybe all right yeah and so finally it's time for the charge bow right and so uh an alien shoots at the flash nicks his leg down he goes so he's like oh it's it's gotta take me another couple of minutes i gotta warm back up i got a charlie horse like you wouldn't believe inside cyborg is waiting for the charge and then steppenwolf sneaks up behind him to clock him with an axe and the whole thing looks like an album cover for molly hatchet and he goes for dark side and as he swings the axe down clunk it lands on superman's shoulder in a very unceremonious way and superman looks back at Steppenwolf, and he goes, not impressed. Which, Bo, if you change this dialogue to something like, why don't we step outside? And you have Christopher Reeve Superman deliver it, and you give me a little bit of that John Williams Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping up and down in my seat. I'm running around the theater doing cartwheels. Yeah. But they this movie does none of that. Right. It, it, all the one-liners, they're so flat and, you know, not impressed. It's just that kind of aggro. As as opposed to, like you said, if Christopher Reeve were like, sorry, Dark Side, we're going to step outside. You're right. It would be so much better. It would feel, even if you kept all the same effects and you could even put them in the black suit, just make Superman a decent, good person. That's all I want. Anyway, Superman blows his cold breath at the axe. It falls to crumbs. Superman just then proceeds to beat the shit out of Steppenwolf. There's more slow motion, more punching. Aquaman and Wonder Woman show up to watch Superman kick Steppenwolf's ass. Then they join in on the fun. Wonder Woman clangs her bracelets. Aquaman does something with his trident. Superman burns off Steppenwolf's horn with his laser vision. That had to hurt. So Cyborg is ready for the charge. The Flash is worthless because he got blasted. And then as Cyborg is inside, wanting the flash to send him the electrical charge to let him do whatever with the unity he connects with the unity and then he kind of disappears into it and superman is still beating the holy hell out of steppenwolf and in this we see a portal open up and there are three bad guys that come out one of which is dark side one of which is decide and the third one i don't recognize because we were never introduced in this movie it's mother something i can't remember mother fate something like that uh yeah i don't remember what the character really the three the three mother boxes have combined it's too late our heroes have failed the mother boxes explode and outside the flash he's like oh i gotta get up i can make this happen i can run as fast as i can and save the day run as fast as you can flash you can do it and so the flash takes off running and as he's going faster and faster and faster and faster he finally goes daddy whatever happens i want you to know the little boy he was one of them dead he was one of the good ones he was one of the best <laughs> And the Flash runs so fast that he reverses time and then runs inside of the cooling chamber to kind of reverse the fact that everything has gone shitty. And then we cut to Cyborg where I guess he's what inside the unity and he's not at this point, it's at a place where he hasn't been all cyborged up and he looks over and he sees a version of Dr. Cyborg's mom and Dr. Cyborg's dad and a young version of himself that is not cyborg. And the unity promises to him that they could all be together and be one happy Dr. Cyborg 
cyborg family, but cyborg says beep bop boop, no. And he uses his cyborg powers to break apart the mother boxes. Superman hops in to help finish the job because Superman has to help everybody do everything, and they break the three boxes apart. And while that's going down, Aquaman is like, brother, I was waiting for you to turn your back. You've been sucker punching me all day, man. Turnabout is fair play. Have some tried it. And he spears Steppenwolf. Uh Uh-huh. And they start punching him through this portal. But before he can go, Wonder Woman jumps in and just cleaves his head off with her sword. The head goes bouncing into the portal and Dark Side just growls and that's it. That's the end of our villains, except for Desaad on the other side, kind of doing a real, I told you so about Steppenwolf. I told you he was a worthless piece of shit. You know, I think he lied on his resume. You look, you told me a lot of things about him. Some were true, some weren't. Uh, let's he's dead now we can be honest but go ahead and ready the armada we're gonna have to do this the old-fashioned way where we just show up with a bunch of ships and invade the planet so superman goes to help batman climb up off the inside of a cooling tower where he's been hiding while everybody else did heroic things and then they all get inside the flying transport which didn't that crash earlier and also three of these four people they don't need to get in a transport to get home i think they can actually fly yeah and then we get a dramatic shot of the league of super justicians and our movie is over roll credits oh uh, if only chad because not only was this nearly unendurably three hours and 40 minutes i know in comes the epilogue yeah father twice over so cyborg's in his apartment He uses his computer skills to reconstruct the tape recorder that was busted earlier. And we hear Dr. Cyborg's dad say, it's me, Cyborg, your father. I'm just so proud of you and who you are and who you've always been. So many wrongs were righted. Everything breaks and everything changes. And then we get shots of Aquaman making up with Willem Dafoe and a bunch of other characters that I don't know. And Aquaman is on a beach and he looks over at his family. He's like, hey, brother, I need to go see my dad. All right, peace out. (laughs) And he gets in the back of a rusty pickup truck and rides off of some drifter, which I'd not expect Aquaman to travel in any other way, except, you know, maybe on the rails. Look, man, I am either thumbing it or I'm railing it. And by railing it, I think I know what you mean. Aqua bro out, brothers. Dr. Cyborg's dad continues to give more worldly advice in this voiceover. Batman, Wonder Woman, and Alfred, they walk into a mansion and Batman says, This is a big house. We could have a big table right there with six chairs because there are six of us. And Wonder Woman says, yes, but there's room for more. And I think Batman (laughs) takes this as a sign that Wonder Woman wants to have babies. Yeah, because he's like, yeah, room for more. I get it. Um, so would you rather I nudge you or call you for breakfast? Huh? (laughs) Here, here in our, our hall of justicians. Speaking of women wanting to have kids, earlier Lois Lane was said to be the key of something darker, according to Batman. I don't really know what that was all about. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really matter. We cut to the Flash, who goes to see his Flash dad in prison, and he's like, hey, look, Pop, I got a job in a crime lab. Are you proud of me now, Daddy? And his dad's like, oh, yeah, the Flash, I'm real proud of you. My boy's got a job, everybody. He does everything but take off his shirt and press his nipple to the glass. It is such an overreaction to his son getting a job. (laughs) Oh, Billy! Because he tells him, this is the lowest thing they could offer me. The janitor is technically my boss. And he's like, you hear that, everyone? You hear that? My my terrible son, my unappealing son got a job. (laughs) Cyborg goes to visit the graves of Dr. Cyborg Mom and Dr. Cyborg Dad. And Dr. Cyborg Dad continues to go on and on about how proud he is of his cyborg son. Commissioner Gordon climbs up on the roof and fires up the bat signal and batman is over on another roof and he is literally looking in the wrong direction of where the bat signal is pointed at the clouds that's why it's such a terrible communication (laughs) method you gotta be looking at the right spot what if it's what if it's not cloudy well then you're you're screwed yeah you gotta why not just give him a phone just give him a cell phone it could be a birder look i'm just paying this monthly okay wonder woman goes back to where she got that arrow earlier in the movie which we're still unclear as to whether or not her home island was slaughtered the flash runs down the street as fast as he can go smiling with a big dopey grin on his face superman now dressed as clark kent walks down the streets of metropolis and he rips open his shirt to show the s on his chest which i know there 
hear a lot of goofs about how people are blind to the fact that Clark Kent is Superman. But honestly, if Superman died and Clark Kent both died around the same time, and then they both came back miraculously from the dead around the same time, doesn't that negate having a secret identity for this character? Well, I think the Richard Donner Perry White would probably buy it. Of You know, if he just walked in and was like, uh-huh. say, Chief, sorry I was gone so long. I was working on a case. Turned out to be nothing. All right, Kent. All right. We cut to a prison where we see Lex Luthor. I think he's in prison for something that happened in the last movie, but I'm not sure. A guard calls out to him, but Luther don't pay him no attention. And then the guard walks over and says, Luther, stop jerking around or I'm going to come in there. And then we get to see Lex Luthor in a straitjacket. And as the guard turns him around, and if you hadn't seen the earlier Batman versus Superman movies, you wouldn't really know that the actor playing Lex Luthor in that film isn't Jeffrey Eisenberg, the one who played Lex Luthor. You really need the guard to say, hey, you're not Lex Luthor. Yeah. Well, we saw Lex Luthor earlier. But you didn't know that's Lex Luthor. He had a big mop top haircut. That's not Lex Luthor. It turns out to be a decoy. The the guard shrieks and runs out and hits the siren. Uh And then we cut to a boat. It's a yacht boat. Well, no, the boat rolling up onto the yacht. And the boat has Deathstroke's helmet. If you read the comics and all that stuff, Deathstroke's a big Batman villain. So he arrives, climbs aboard the yacht, which is where Lex Luthor is now holding up and pulls off his helmet turns out it's joe manginelli manginello big dick richie that's what you need yeah, it's to know. big dick richie from magic mike yeah so big dick richie is like so you called me all the way out here luther what's going on and lex luther uh, is like i'm here to tell you the secret identity of batman are you interested now you want to see my big dick actually i can already see it through your pants you do not need to reveal it to me at first i thought that was your belt but then I realized that was your penis. Yes, it makes me uncomfortable, but also incredibly curious. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Listen, Deathstroke. What's important is that you know that Batman's secret identity is Bruce Wayne. Cut to some hellscape from a Mad Max movie or a Terminator spinoff, and they're flying parademons everywhere, and Batman staggers out with a gun. There's UFOs in the sky. He's got this long rifle. Cyborg shows up draped in a cloak. Deathstroke, the guy we just saw with the giant cock, he's there, but he's on Team Batman. Mira, the Aqua Lady we saw earlier, she's there, and she's all pissed off, and she's talking about, you know, I'm gonna stab the bastard through the heart! And then I think we see the Flash in the background walking around with a mustache yeah and he's got like flash armor mira says hey what do you know batman who have you ever loved and then we pan over to jared leto's version of the joker who gives it his "Ah, ah, ah, ah." he loved and lost a mother and a father and an adopted son is that robin he adopted a kid yeah, the, that's the implication. And there was something in, I think it was in, in Batman v Superman, like the, the Robin outfit was in. That was in Suicide Squad, that's right. But at any rate, yeah, I mean, that's in the, the comic fiction and so forth that Joker. How many people can die in your arms, Batman, before you die inside? Stop it, Joker. You just got to say no sex to me, Joker. I'm Batman. And the Joker says... You won't kill me, Bruce. I'm your best friend. Besides, who's going to give you a reach around? That is actual dialogue in this movie. I'll go you one better. There's a point like where Batman has just had it with the Joker because, you know, these two. Uh Uh-huh. He says, make no mistake. I will fucking kill you. Yeah. What? Yeah. I understand that the, this is a hellscape and so forth, but... You got F-bombs, you got advanced placement sex ed showing up with the reach-around stuff. It's the last three, four minutes of our movie. We're talking about guys having anal sex and jerking each other off. Batman saying that when Harley Quinn, when she died in my arms, she begged me to kill you slow, Joker. And you're like, what? Ah, 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 ah. Let's have a truce, Batman. Here, take this card. It's the Joker card. Isn't that clever? And then Superman crashes down on the ground with glowing red eyes. And he's wearing the red and blue outfit. He's not in the black outfit anymore. Uh, the good guy Superman outfit. Oh, he's evil. Okay. And then everybody arms up. They got their guns. We're about to have a fight. Hard cut. Woo! We're back in Batman's bedroom and he's dressed up as Bruce Wayne. And it's like, this is all, it's all nightmare, Bo. Ho, ho. Batman gets up. He walks outside onto the patio of his house in the woods. And then Mark 
Marvin the Martian Manhunter shows up and he says, mm, Dark Side isn't finished with Earth. We have to find the anti-life before he does. I have a stake in this world and I would like to help. Your parents would be so proud of how you unified all these heroes. By the way, my name is Martian Manhunter. This whole scene, Ben Affleck as Batman, he looks equally as bored and uninterested in all this as we the viewing audience are. He's just like, all right, whatever. Glad you're here. And then Marvin the Martian flies away. Final credits roll. Thank God. That's four hours. And strangely, this episode or this discussion, shorter in length than the movie itself. Maybe the first time we've ever done that. During the closing credits, you do get a cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah mm -hmm. as performed by Alison Crow. It's a real mystery how that song wasn't in the actual film. There's no post credit scene as well. Yeah. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that's something. So that's our 100th episode, Bo. What a god awful movie experience this thing is we had a live studio audience we had all of our interns come back to listen to us talk about this nonsense we're so sorry everyone i hope you're all equally well fed and you're all drunk because as i look over into the glass booth half of the people are gone yeah the, the <laughs> other half are, are swinging from the rafters hopefully they've all gone to the after party that's where the real fun's gonna happen that's where we get into uh all the good stuff you know like all all the a material we were saving for the private <laughs> vip we're gonna we're just we're actually we're doing the whole show again just for them because they paid the 500 dollars for the seat so i promise you we will never ever do a movie this long again unless we review heaven's gate as you mentioned earlier as a director's cut which might be a good time but i don't think we're good yeah that that seems like a long shot this is a truly terrible movie sorry this was the 100th episode but also how fitting that it was i regret nothing really Bo, what would you care to propose as our 101st episode during this season, Comic Sans Quality? Why, how about a, a, a league of our own, Chad? Another league, this one of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Once again, we play our dangerous game, Chad. As Sean Connery leads uh, such <laughs> characters as... Tom Sawyer. It's Tom Sawyer and Mina Harker and I, I think maybe <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, maybe. I don't remember. It's all a lot of nonsense. <laughs> Some of the worst CGI that we're ever going to talk about on this show. So, yeah, it's got to be a great time because that movie is utter nonsense start to finish. That sounds perfect. Also, <laughs> definitely less than four hours. For everyone who has enjoyed some, if not all of our episodes over the past three years, thank you so much for listening. We have had an absolutely wonderful full time putting together these episodes we love to hear your feedback we love to read your reviews you can contact us at pick six movies at gmail.com you can leave us reviews wherever you want you can find us on social media so any final thoughts that you have on Zack snyder's justice league as we close the books on our 100th episode yes i will kind of quote myself here i don't think the opposite of entertainment is boredom i think it's this movie <laughs> we will see you all in two weeks time assuming that we do not die at the after party i've got some dynamite and i heard there are horses <laughs> yeah no promises <laughs>